Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Bienvenue au Conseil municipal de la Ville d'Ottawa pour le 10 juin 2020. Uh, welcome to Ottawa City Council meeting for the 10th of June 2020. We'll begin the meeting in one minute. On va commencer la réunion dans une minute. Merci. Thank you. And uh, welcome to Ottawa City Council for the 10th of June 2020. Bienvenue à la réunion du Conseil municipal pour le 10 juin uh, 2020. For those who are able to, uh, please arise for a moment of personal reflection. Thank you. Merci. Uh, colleagues on the phone, uh, please uh, remember to keep the phone on mute at all times unless called upon to speak. Do not put the phone on hold. Uh, please avoid using speakerphone when speaking. And if you're watching the council meeting in the background on Rogers Cable 22 ou en français Cable 23, please turn off the volume before unmuting your phone. A confirmation of minutes, adoption de process verbal pour le 27 mai 2020. Confirmation of the minutes of the 27th of May 2020. Mr. Mayor, aren't you going to take call first? Yes, thank you, Eli, for correcting me. Uh, roll call, please, Madam Deputy Clerk. I was so excited about the minutes. <laughs> Councillor Ulof? Here and also excited about the minutes. Councillor Dudas? Easy. Councillor Harder? Here. Councillor Suds? Here. Councillor El Shantiri? Present. Councillor Gower? <coughs> Councillor Gower? Councillor Cavanaugh? Here. Councillor Shirelli? Here. Councillor Eglai. Here. Councillor Deans. Councillor Tierney. Present. Conseil Fleury. Ici. Councillor King. Here. Councillor McKenney. Present. Councillor Leeper. Here. Councillor Brockington. Here. Councillor Menard. Present. Conseil Cloutier. Présent. Councillor DeRouz. Here. Councillor Moffat. Here. Councillor Meehan. Present. Councillor Hubley. Here. Councillor Gower. Here. Mayor Watson. You see? You have a quorum, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, now, confirmation of minutes for the, the 27th of May, pour le 27 May 2020. Carried. 
Okay. Head update. Thank you. Uh, and declaration of interest, including those originally rising from prior meetings, declaration de conflict d'intérêt. Uh, Councillor Shirelli. Thank you, Your Worship. Whereas subsection 5.3 of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act provides that where the interest of a member has not been disclosed by reason of a member's absence from the meeting at which the matter is considered, the member shall disclose the interest at the first meeting of council attended by the member. I, Councillor Rick Shirelli, declare an interest, a pecuniary interest in the following matter considered by council, matters considered by council. A, notice to council May 13th, 2020, that a second interim report from the Integrity Commissioner would be presented at the next council meeting. And B, the motion to receive reports number three, interim report, to Council on an inquiry respecting the conduct of Councillor Shirelli considered by City Council on May 27th, 2020. Okay, thank you. Are there any other conflicts of interest? Est-ce qu'il y a des autres conflits d'intérêt? Okay, thank you. Communications as presented. Regrets, Councillor Deans advised should be absent from the City Council meeting of uh, 10th of June, 2020. A motion to introduce reports. A motion portant présentation de rapport. Councillor Dudas, seconded by Councillor El Shantiri, please. That the following reports be received and considered. The report from the Ottawa Community Housing Corporation entitled Ottawa Community Housing Corporation Annual Report and Annual General Meeting of the Shareholder. The reports from the Finance Services Department entitled Sinking Fund Financial Statements 2019 and 2019 City of Ottawa Consolidated Financial Statements. Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee Report 13, Finance and Economic Development Committee Report 14, Planning Committee Report 23, Transportation Committee Report 9, and the report from the City Clerk and Solicitor's Office entitled Summary of Oral and Written Public Submissions for Items Subject to the Planning Act, Explanation Requirements at the City Council Meeting of May 27, 2020, be received and considered, and that the rules of procedure be suspended to receive and consider a matter rising from the Special Transit Commission meeting of June 10, 2020, with respect to the tentative collective agreement with the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 279, as it is in the city's best interest to consider this matter immediately. Thank you, Councillor Dudas and Councillor El Shantiri. On the motion, carried. Adopté, merci. Uh, Marché d'Ottawa Markets annual general meeting. We'll come back to that after we do the consent agenda, uh, as well as Ottawa Community Housing annual general meeting. Right. So, uh, first uh, item is uh, reports, uh, rapport, finance service department, uh, sinking fund financial statements uh, 2019. Carried? Carried. Item, item 5, 2019 City of Ottawa consolidated fi financial statements. Approved? Carried? Approved. Uh, committee reports, uh, FEDCO, uh, report number 14, rapport numéro 14, de Comité des Finances et de Développement Économique. Motion, uh, Council appoint Ro Councillor Rolson King as the Council Liaison for Anti-Racism and Ethnocultural Relations Initiatives for the 2018-2022 term of Council. Councillor uh, King, would you like to speak to this? Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. So we'll, we'll come back to, to that. Council, we'll sure, come back, we'll, sure. just fi we'll finish the consent agenda. Thank you. Uh, Transportation uh, Committee Report uh, Number Nine, Rapport Numero Nif, Ottawa's Electric Kick uh, Scooter Strategy and Pilot Project. Does anyone wish to speak on this? I do. Just a quick question. question to staff. Okay, I, we'll hold that then, and uh, it, it goes hand in hand with Item Number Eight, which is Bike Sharing Electronic uh, or Electric Kick Scooter Sharing Agreements. We'll come back to that. Item number nine, a Vanguard Drive Extension, Lancier Drive to Mer Bleu Road, Environmental Assessment Study, uh, Chemin Vanguard de la Promenade Lancier au Chemin de la Mer Bleu, Etude Environmentale. Excusez-moi. Carried? Carried. Carried. Uh, item 10, motion, support for the adoption of small businesses to physical distancing requirements. We have a couple of motions, so we'll come back to that. Uh, the bulk consent agenda, does anyone wish to remove anything from the bulk consent agenda? On the bulk consent agenda is presented. Carried? Carried. Okay, so uh, we'll go back. We have uh, two annual general uh, meeting uh, sessions today. The first is uh, Ottawa Markets, Marché d'Ottawa. 
Councillor Dudas and El Shantiri have a motion uh, to recess, uh, to hold the annual meeting of the members of Marche d'Ottawa Markets. Councillor Dudas, please. The council recess for the purposes of holding the annual general annual meeting of members of the Marche d'Ottawa Markets, and that upon the conclusion of the annual meeting, the meeting of council resumes. On the motion, carried. Carried. Okay. So I'd like to uh, introduce the Ottawa Markets Interim Chair, Board Chair, Brian Chandler, who will call the meeting of the members of, uh, to order before confirming uh, the Mayor as Chair of the meeting. So Mr. Chandler, welcome. The floor is yours. Welcome to the annual general meeting of Ottawa Markets. I would like to call the annual general meeting to order and confirm that notice of this meeting having been properly delivered and a quorum of members being present, I declare this meeting to be properly constituted. If there are no objections, I would like to move to appoint Mayor Watson as chair of this meeting. On the motion, carried. Adopt day. Carried, carried. Merci. So we'll now deal with some administrative matters. The first item contained in the notice of meeting, which is, was delivered to you on May 21st, is the text of a resolution passed by the Board of Directors amending bylaw number one to permit members to hold meetings by telephonic, electronic, or other communication facility. In your meeting materials is a copy of the text of the resolution. I'd now like to move to ratify the resolution. Therefore, if I do not hear from you, you will have deemed to have accepted the motion. If no dissenting members state, uh, having not heard from the member, I declare the motion carried by the members. And if dissenting members state, members re representing less than 50% of the votes have indicated they are not in favor of passing the motion. Therefore, I declare the motion carried by members. So, on the motion, this is for electronic meetings and so on. Carried? Carried. Right, carried, okay, thank you. Uh, the second item, I'd like to move to pass the following resolution. Resolve that Welsh LLP be appointed as public account accountant to hold office until the next annual general meeting of the members. If I do not hear from you, you will, uh, you will be deemed to have accepted the motion. If no dissenting uh, member state have not heard from any members, I declare the motion carried by the members. Uh, on the motion to appoint uh, Welch LLP as a public accountant. Carried. Adopted. Carried. Thank you. Uh, third item, I'd like to pass the following resolution. Uh, resolve that Sunita Millington and Greg Scott Nicky be re-elected as directors for a further three-year term. On the motion, carried. Adopted. Carried. I'll now ask Brian Chandler to present the annual report to the meeting. Brian, the floor is yours. Good, good morning. Um, so now I will refer to the presentation that was sent around. Um, note the presentation will be in English. Uh, it is available in French if you need. Um, next slide to the agenda. Um, we have conducted the meeting business. Next slide, please. From the message from the chair, uh, we'll do a quick financial update of the financial statements, review our properties, uh, and then talk about a year in review. Uh, and then I will hand it over to our executive director to do a look ahead. Next slide, please. Um, finance and property. Next slide. Um, here and on the financial slide. slide here, you, uh, and then I will hand over to our inspector to do um, You will see the revenues and direct operating expenses. There are no significant changes um, year over year. You will see the uh, importance of the indoor revenues related to 55 byword and 70 clearance uh, as well as the outdoor revenues there was a small decrease in outdoor revenues um, the gross profit is then applied to how we maintain our operation um, next slide please um, on the second page of financials um, you'll note the remuneration of our staff as well as the advertising uh, promotional items and the the, uh, the legal professional fees and repairs and maintenance and other operations of both the building, the operation, and the area. Um, 
it is our goal every year to deploy all of the resources that we have. We have a small net surplus this year. Uh, we will be on talking to the community and working with the community on how do we best deploy the uh, monies that we generate every year. Um, next slide, please, on the property. Um, for 55 Byward, we have 23 rentable spaces. You will see our occupancy at 94%. 70 Clarence, we have seven rentable spaces um, with 100% occupancy. Um, the outdoor market at Byward, we have over 200 stalls. Um, they currently operate at 55% occupancy, and Parkdale is at 90%. Um, one of the things to note is that with COVID, there could be a, a vacancy increase of 10 to 30%, depending on how the recovery evolves, but we'll talk a little bit more about COVID later. Uh, next slide. Um, through 2020 and 2021, we are, will be aiming to address an outstanding backlog of work. Uh, we're currently working with the city to finalize agreements and project charters. Um, one of the reasons why we must address a lot of these items is we have an extremely high operating cost and bringing down those operating costs we feel is very important for the long-term standing of the building and the livelihood of our tenants. Um, and with 70 clearance, one of the big issues that we have there uh, is just aligning with the public realm plan and having in place a, a good move forward strategy for those. Um, so we will anticipate having or implementing and moving forward on all of these major capital improvements in 2020. Next slide, please, to the year in review. Um, next slide, some of the main items that we were able to implement in 2019, were, there was the William Street pilot project. Um, we completed a fully accessible public washroom on the main floor. Uh, we completed a waste room facility, and one of the main uh, objectives to that is now we can look at implementing some more sustainable, sustainability objectives, and, which is one of the core drivers and things that we have been asked to look at. Uh, our executive, previous executive director was on a two-year contract, and we have now hired a new executive director. His name is Zach Daler. And we also... It took time uh, and ha hired a consultant to work on a strategic implementation framework and action plan. Over the previous two years, we have spent a lot of time gaining a lot of information. We prepared a strategic plan. We had an economic report, and, and the public realm plan has been going on, and we needed to kind of bring together all that, info, all that information and put it in a format that allows us to really itemize and implement specific items going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, the William Street pilot project, um, it was considered a success in creating a unique place for visitors and residents to hang out. One of the anecdotal um, things that was noted was that a lot more families were using the space than the rest of the market. Um, and the most telling aspect of this report is that 78% uh, of visitors and said that the experience on William Street improved their experience of the overall Byward market. Um, so there is a plan to reclose it uh, again this year, and that's another thing that Council will be considering. Next slide, please. Um, the completion of the accessible washroom of note is that the we will be we are now in a position to reopen the accessible washroom as of tomorrow. Um, we know that there has been uh, a little bit of a dry area with the closing of, closing of the Rideau Center and of the overall area, so that will be reopened. Um, and the upgraded waste facilities um, will allow us to reduce operating costs and explore additional compost and recycling methods. Uh, our new next slide, please. Moving to our executive director. Um, Zach Daler was hired in March of 2020, about a week before everything closed. Um, his mandate and focus will be on implementing the five and ten year strategic implementation plan, really focusing on community engagement. This neighborhood is a very complex neighborhood with many, many stakeholders, so we have a distinct focus on that. Um, renewing and rethinking market offerings and supporting the alignment to the public realm plan um, which will soon be presented to Council. Next slide, please. 
Um, the strategic implementation plan or framework, this is something the board uh, pushed forward. There were, with all the moving pieces, with all the information that we've been collecting over our two years of existence, we found that we needed uh, support in kind of drilling down and understanding how do we move the needle more specifically on some of the key objectives. I will now turn the presentation over to Zach to talk more about that uh, and where we are going forward in 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, Council. Thanks very much for having us here. I'm excited to go over uh, where we're headed um, and hopefully uh, engage with all of you uh, over the coming months because we, we know our markets are important to, to every part of our communities. So our strategic implementation framework and action plan is meant to be uh, a playbook of sorts uh, to moving the market forward. Um, so the first strategic direction is delivering a, dy a dynamic market experience. And what we're working on for this through to 2021, um, 2025 as we go forward is uh, enabling a broader retail mix um, that supports uh, the local food vision we all know um, local food and, and food supplies uh, in, in close proximity to us are, are gaining importance, um, but also taking the opportunity to re-engage uh, with those local producers, re-engage with groups like the Ottawa Farmers Market um, to see if we can't uh, align a bit more of our work here to provide a better and more cohesive uh, product and offering to, to residents uh, and, and visitors. Um, as well, this extends into our buildings at 55 uh, and 70 uh, clearance there. Uh, the aim here is to make sure that our retail mix is diverse enough and is meeting the needs uh, of the residents and visitors which leads us into strategic direction two, uh, which is where we get a little bit more into the physical assets that we maintain. And the goal of this through 2021 through to 2030 uh, is to really um, work to transform it into a district um, that focuses on public space, a vibrant downtown mixed use um, with Parkdale, uh, which is also uh, an area that we manage, uh, really making sure that we're integrated into that neighborhood. We have a lot of success in Parkdale and a lot of community support. Um, so we just need to make sure that our product here in the Byward market uh, is as solid uh, as it is at Parkdale and, and vice versa. Um, and then as well, uh, a major component of this um, is aligning with uh, the public realm plan as that moves forward. So for us, um, strategic direction one in terms of our offerings and then strategic direction two in terms of transforming the Ottawa markets. Next slide, please. Um, if we've skipped a slide, uh, we should be on looking ahead for 2020. Next slide. Um, so a brief point on the COVID reality. Uh, I don't think anybody uh, could have uh, sort of forecasted uh, with any accuracy sort of what this would look like or going forward from uh, March until today. Um, I have to give uh, a shout out to uh, our team here at Ottawa Markets and, and to city staff. Uh, for working with us to unroll our pick and click uh, model. Uh, this was an initiative that uh, the team here, uh, when we knew we couldn't open, knew we had to pivot uh, to provide uh, support for local producers uh, and saw a significant opportunity for us to re-engage uh, with, with local producers. So uh, from there, uh, we worked with public health and city team uh, to create our pick and click model. Uh, and I'm pleased to report um, that we've had over 3,000 store views, We've actually had to close the store a couple of occasions because product has been uh, sold out. Uh, and in the short time we've been running it, uh, we've been able to contribute over $66,000 to local producers. Um, obviously, this isn't sort of the level that we, we normally operate at, uh, but at a time uh, where there was likely uh, potentially for nothing, uh, I'm pleased we were able to operate uh, under this fashion and also lead the way for the other markets uh, in the city. Um, and again, as we continue to move forward, I uh, highlight here now the uh, public realm plan. So I, I noted uh, that we have our strategic implementation uh, framework and action plan in terms of our operations. A uh, major component of that is taking our uh, mission. So next slide, please. Next slide, we'll land on our mission. Uh, so just want everybody just to take a quick look at that. So. Uh, in terms of our role and what we're doing, um, next slide, we want to take that mission into a vision that allows us to become a platform and showcase for our nation's capital. The idea here, next slide, and I'm going to read from this slide for you, is Ottawa markets as a premier showcase of everything local that makes Ottawa, well, Ottawa, 
from the local farmer's market to local entertainment and fan favorite retail, the vision sees a broader scope and view of our operations with an eye of being the area curator for the local community and visitor. Now, a point that I want to make on this is that uh, the anchor of this is very much so the market experience, local food, local produce. That's why the mission is there that highlights our uh, sustainability and, and focus on, on food. Um, so as we go forward, we think we can uh, work with the city of Ottawa um, to you know, champion elements of the public realm plan, um, but also create a, a new and push a new uh, experience, one that is uh, less focused on competition between other areas areas and more focused on the idea of celebrating Ottawa and all of the wonderful and amazing uh, products, uh, restaurants, entrepreneurs that we have here, a real showcase for the city. Not an easy task, but one that we're excited to, to champion and to push forward. Next slide. So our next steps for this is uh, obviously in the short term focusing on bringing local back, as I said, uh, engaging again with local producers, uh, engaging with Ottawa Farmers Market and a, a major piece of this. Um, will be the realignment of the market bylaw to local producers and the public realm plan. Uh, that is something that we are going uh, and working on now, and I am hopeful and optimistic that it's something that Council uh, should, should potentially be considering um, this year. Uh, as well, to move us forward, we're likely going to be pulling together a request for interest on the renovation to the 55 Byward Market building. Uh, our chair, uh, Brian, noted uh, we have a significant challenge in the operational costs uh, of that, so we need to look to see how we can uh, improve uh, on that, um, but also uh, to capture, if you will, a moment of history in 2020, uh, we have a great opportunity to uh, add a chapter to the long and, and storied history of the market uh, and hopefully uh, one uh, that uh, really focuses on, on engaging with the residents and, and, and the local community uh, because it's from here um, that we will rebuild back to, to tourism, um, not forgetting that that's an incredibly important component, um, but for the next while, our focus is very much so on the local community. Uh, and then as well, uh, I mentioned alignment with the public realm plan to 70 clearance. Uh, Brian noted, you know, our operations are aligned to our ability to generate uh, rental income that we then turn around into sort of public area management. So some thinking there needs to be done. Uh, we will be recommending the official closing of William Street Pedestrian Plaza. Again, we're working through that with city staff, and they've been great um, to create that pedestrianized area. And then one of the things that we are going to examine is the seasonal closing of Byward Market Square. Again, this is one of those things that aligns with uh, some other thinking in the city, um, but also in the new COVID reality, uh, trying to create uh, spaces for, for public to space out, but also to feel comfortable uh, in terms of... Uh, their experience. Next slide. And so we end with this. I'm very excited to let you all know uh, we will be opening the Parkdale Market and the Byward Market the week of June 15th. Um, this is uh, really exciting. It's a lot of work for the team. It's a lot of work for the, the city staff. So again, appreciate the efforts there. Uh, for Parkdale and both for Byward, uh, we will slowly be enrolling um, the vendors. So uh, we are implementing physical distancing measures. Uh, we are implementing uh, sanitization stations. Uh, we've got distancing decals installed around uh, both of the markets. Uh, but we will be working with each one of the producers to make sure that their uh, approach and their measures are uh, appropriate for um, serving customers. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope we've perhaps uh, provided you here with some thinking as we go forward. Um, happy to turn it back over to uh, you, Brian, uh, or uh, the mayor for any questions. Thank you. Mr. Chair, do you have anything else to add before we go to questions? Mm, no, uh, no, thank you. Okay. Mayor Watson, you can now go to questions. Great. Well, thank uh, thank you, first of all, Brian, for volunteering to be chair. And the, I know the number of hours you're putting in to the, the job, and we really appreciate that, and your board members as well, if you could pass that along, as well as uh, congratulations uh, to Zach on his new appointment. So we'll go to the ward councillors first. Councillor Leeper, uh, do you have any questions or comments on uh, the presentation? Um, 
Um, I just have one. First, I just want to say uh, welcome aboard both uh, Brian and uh, Zach. It's good to be working with you again. Uh, I'm very excited, as is the um, uh, community, about the June 15th opening. Uh, we've gotten a lot of mail about that, so looking forward to uh, getting those stalls open. Uh, with respect to the Parkdale Market, uh, you noted, or Brian, you noted a couple of uh, public realm type studies. Do you anticipate doing much with the Parkdale Market? It kind of just chugs along doing its thing. Um, but do you see opportunities and, and how would you pursue those for uh, public ground improvements to the Parkdale market? Um, thank you for the question, Councillor Lieber. Uh, so when, when I started, one of the very first things that I did was we meet with the Wellington West BIA and Dennis Van Stuyleden and really try to get a handle on um, what the community thinks and feels about the market. The overwhelming response initially has been they are willing to listen to new ideas but really like where their market how it's currently situated and and some of the realities of that uh, of how it is currently presented um, the, the Wellington West BIA is also in a very strong position to um, program the park and do some of the items in the in the community where in the byword we you know do more of the programming so it, it is been a much more um, collaborative kind of understanding with the, the community groups there. And I think that um, I'll add, let Zach add a comment or two if he has one, but we haven't seen the same desire or the same need to kind of push any further agenda, but more to kind of work as a partner with the, the local BIA. Zach? The only, the only thing I would add there, uh, Councillor Leeper, is um, with Parkdale, uh, if you look at our, our interest in terms of vendors, um, Parkdale normally comes in at around 90, 95% sort of interest in terms of uh, stands and, and sellers. So there's a strong interest for what is there. I think what we're looking at in terms of specific things is how can we enhance that, you know, and, and reduce our operating costs. So, for example, each year we install that plastic wrap. Well, is there a more elegant solution we can do that enhances the space but also reduces that cost in terms of year after year? Um, so in terms of Parkdale, my interest is, is on how we can really refine it as opposed to perhaps uh, change it and, and always open to, to community input there. Thank you both for those answers. Uh, and I, I do appreciate the strong partnership model that you've adopted, both with the Wellington West BIA and also with the Hindenburg Community Association. Uh, I think there's a, a great model for collaboration to make sure that that's a really strong uh, public space uh, for the, uh, you know, in perpetuity. Uh, Chair, that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Councillor Leeper. Conseiller Fleury, s'il vous plaît. Mr. Mr. Matt, I too would want to echo uh, uh, Councillor Leeper's comments as it relates to uh, the great work of, uh, of Zach and Brian so far. We're excited to work with them. Uh, Zach, maybe you could take a second and just speak to uh, two of the governance challenges as it relates to uh, Byward Building zoning and also the Byward Market Bylaw and what Ottawa Market's intent is for the coming year. Uh, certainly. Thanks for the question. Uh, so two things. In terms of the bylaw, um, it, is, it is a robust document that outlines um, types of vendors, categories, locations, and, and it has a lot in it. Our intent is to try and simplify that if we can, um, and whether or not it's a bylaw that notes sort of what is allowed in a particular area uh, and then points to operational procedures. Uh, really what we would be looking for uh, is to create some flexibility um, to engage with local producers. Again, if you know the history of the market, um, the rift sort of happened over a bylaw discussion about who can sell and who can't sell. Uh, so the intent is to try and create some flexibility um, to really focus on local producers, but obviously find some space for the, the resellers. So uh, our hope is to, to, again, focus on sort of a larger area in terms of the bylaw that aligns with the public realm plan and note our operational procedures um, that likely will align very closely with the bylaw, um, but that allow us to, to adjust those to, to meet the needs of the growers and the, the sellers. Um, the second question that you raised about the zoning is for our property right now, uh, and, and forgive me, it's, I'm missing it off the top of my head, uh, we exist in a very narrow subzone, uh, and if we can be reclassified um, within the same subzone, just a, a different category, I think it's a, a subzone three, for example, 
um, that just allows us a broader um, opportunity to go out and engage uh, new uh, tenants in our properties if we lose them through this COVID opportunity. Um, and it's and again, I just want to reinforce: it's not that we're looking to go out and add sort of what's already there. The the, the intent and the goal is to have some more flexibility uh, because right now it's limited sort of between quick food and uh, tourism focused entities and and we think that that just with a little bit more flexibility we can attract um, perhaps startups or we can attract um, some of those uh, smaller uh, type uh, businesses even to our second floor uh, and on the main areas uh, at both 55 and 70. So a bit of a long-winded answer but the hope is to provide some flexibility in our bylaw and then as well gain some uh, added flexibility in our in our category as a as a subzone. Thank you, and Mr. Mayor, I, I wonder if it's possible to get a, an update on the public ground plan from city staff as, as it refers to, uh, to the role of the market. Maybe Mr. Willis or Mr. Curry can, can comment. Yeah, Marilyn Journo is on the line. Marilyn, would you like to comment? Yeah, so the public ground plan is underway. It's currently out for public consultation. Uh, the Byward Market Public Realm Plan is a, an important piece of work. It uh, will set the vision for the market and uh, change it from, a, you know, a more um, pedestrian-friendly uh, market area. So uh, currently there, we're out for consultation and we're receiving comments until the end of, uh, or basically June 26th. And uh, people could submit their comments on Ottawa.ca and we will be reporting back to council at uh, in the fall. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to ask a question or a comment before we go to a motion? Okay, so Councillor Leeper. Have... Sorry, who was that? Uh, Councillor Brockington. Okay, go ahead, Councillor. Just, just one question, and that is, um, in addition to the stalls that will be open at the Byward Market, will the um, storefronts inside the market building that have the ability to open their exterior wall, are, are they going to be allowed to open as well? Uh, so thank you, Councillor uh, Brockington. Uh, so the businesses that have uh, been deemed essential actually have never had to close uh, because they have exterior entrance so they can open they've, they've chosen to close uh, we are working uh, with our businesses right now to reopen uh, the property um, so people can open as of the order being lifted um, some may choose to continue to take time um, but it is our intent to fully open the building um, shortly well on, on June 15th if we excellent. can excellent thanks very much Okay, so we'll resume uh, to regular council. Uh, thank you, uh, Brian and Zach, and Councillor Leeper. Uh, you have a motion uh, seconded by Councillor Fleury. If you'd like to introduce it, Councillor Leeper. Uh, sure, Chair. Uh, asking that the rules of procedure be suspended to consider the following motion. On suspension. City of Ottawa. Sorry, just a second, Councillor. On suspension, carried. Carried. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor. Uh, so the motion itself is, whereas the City of Ottawa and Ottawa Markets entered into a service and asset management agreement on December 29, 2017, and whereas Section 10C of the service and asset management agreement requires Marche d'Ottawa Markets to submit for information its audited financial statements to the City Treasurer on or before February 15th of each calendar year, and whereas the audited financial statements for 2019 were submitted on June 4th, 2020, due to unforeseen circumstances, and whereas Marche d'Ottawa Markets Board of Directors passed a motion on April 27, 2020, requesting an amendment to Section 10C of the Service and Asset Management Agreement. Therefore, be it resolved that Section 10C of the Service and Asset Management Agreement be amended to read, Ottawa Markets shall submit for information its audited financial statements to the City Treasurer on or before March 31st of each calendar year. Okay, so this is just changing the, the date of the uh, fiscal year. Uh, any questions or comments? So on the motion, carried. Adopt A. Carried. Carried. Thank you. Uh, carried. Thank you very much. We'll now go to Ottawa Community Housing Corporation, Société de Logement Communautaire d'Ottawa, for their annual general meeting of the shareholder. Uh, we welcome uh, President and CEO Stéphane Giguère and Board Chair Conseiller Fleury.
The floor is yours. Yes, Mr. 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 Massen, please uh, want to confirm that Stefan's on the line? Yes, I am. Perfect. Good morning, bonjour. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. Mr. Maire, conseiller distingué invité virtuel. Mr. Mayor, distinguished guests, I'm very pleased to be here with you this morning for the presentation of the 2019 Annual Report of Ottawa Community Housing Corporation. As Chair of the Board, I have a privileged perspective on this, which is very proactive, and that can be adapted by creating an impact on our community and the uh, renters. With 15,000 homes. We are a landlord with a heart serving all demographics in most neighborhoods in Ottawa. Housing is a human right. The work of OCH goes beyond maintaining its portfolio and proudly extends into building resilient communities. Keep, uh, Matt, are you still there? Yeah. Go ahead. OCH not only takes pride in supporting and engaging with tenants, but makes it fundamental in delivering tenant-focused services. The 2019 annual report shows how the corporation um, works for the promotion of its strategies. Oh. On our city's housing waiting list for a home, Ottawa has declared a housing and homelessness emergency. The city has created an environment in favor of expanding and developing more affordable housing. In doing so, it enables OCH to advance an integrated plan for significantly intensifying the construction of thousands of new homes to support local priorities and to offer newer and greener housing solutions for the next decade. Stefan will provide some highlights about OCH's 10-year development framework and what it means in terms of Ottawa's upcoming affordable housing development. I encourage all of you to read about it in your copy of the annual report. Let me reaffirm OCH will play a critical role in tackling the affordable housing waiting list. Throughout 2019, the Board of Directors has paved the way for the corporation to become an innovative public landlord and a builder of choice for affordable housing. In 2019, 34 civic leaders made up our governance team, including elected officials, Councillor Kavanaugh, Councillor King, Councillor McKinney, and Councillor Moffitt, community volunteers, and the tenants living with us. This year, our board was also shortlisted for best approach to achieve achieving board and committee operations as part of the Governance Professionals of Canada's Excellence in Governance Awards. I want to thank all the members for their energy and commitment and wide-ranging perspective in shaping and strengthening our governance leadership. I'd like to thank the city also for the important partnership that we have, thanks to their cooperation. Stefan and the entire team for their, resilient, through, their, their resilience throughout the COVID period. Like many at the city, OCH is a frontline workforce and has been able to continue offering urgent and safe services for tenants during the pandemic. I'll now give the mic to Stéphane, who is the general manager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Conseiller Fleury, your worship and councillors. Uh, we do have a presentation. I don't know if it's going up right now. Cela me fait énormément plaisir. I am very pleased to be with you this morning on behalf of our team and the renters of uh, Ottawa Community Housing Corporation. We have a slide that should be on the screen. Next slide. So, uh, Ottawa Community Housing was an essential service, an essential services during the pandemic. We needed to have a adaptation capacity in order to reinvent and deploy emergency resources to meet the needs of our renters report, I need to publicly acknowledge the amazing efforts made by the tenants, the employees, the contractors, the agency partners, the many volunteers, the City of Ottawa Human Needs Task Force, and Ottawa Public Health. Amongst the many achievements, one that I'm really proud is the Tenant Outreach Campaign. Based on the recent count, over 12,000 wellness contacts and more than 4,500 visits were conducted. 
Ottawa Community Housing's remarkable ongoing response to this crisis also comes in large part from the resiliency and core strength that is showcased in this report. The 2019 annual report highlights the performance of our team and critical results from the fourth year of our 10-year strategic plan. I'm very proud to share with you everything that the corporation did to make a difference. In 2019, OCH saw the number of engaged communities increase, including the active participation of Whoa. including the active participation of over 1,000 tenants. More tenants are taking the lead to promote positive community building activities. I am really proud okay. of this. In, in late November, OCH launched the Tenant Talks. It is a collaboration between various groups of tenants to modernize service standards and procedures to enhance the tenant experience. Tenant Talks sessions are now virtual sessions, allowing us to increase tenant engagement. Next slide, please. We are proud because every day we make a difference in the housing affordability. With an overall 1.8% vacancy rate in Ottawa and a growing wait list of more than 12,000 people, more than ever, OCH stands ready to respond to the growing affordable housing needs of our city. In fact, OCH is preparing for its most significant expansion ever. The 10-year housing development framework sets goals to add thousands of new homes. Currently, OCH has more than 450 new homes in the making in several Ottawa communities. Our plan responds to the significant affordable housing shortage addressed in both the 10-year housing and homelessness plan and the official plan of the city. In 2019, OCH continued to make capital investments of almost $50 million in its portfolio of 15,000 homes. This program is ongoing and funding is critical, given that OCH buildings are averaging 50 years old. Ernst & Young provided an unqualified audit opinion stating that the last year's financial statements are fair, accurate, and consistent. They also show that we manage within our operating budget. OCH ends the year with an overall reserve balance of $68.7 million, sufficient to support strategic goals and OCH commitment to housing needs. Next slide, please. Yeah, I think uh, we are Stefan. Stefan, sorry, if I could just remind, there's one member of council that is not on mute, and we can hear everything. So if you Thank could you, please Mayor. put yourself on mute. Thank you, merci. Back to you, Stefan. Thank you, Mayor Watson. Much appreciated. We are proud because every day we make a difference in Ottawa. Behind this report are the employees of OCH. I am proud to work with a group of talented and dedicated employees. Their ongoing commitment to our mandate, our values, and their specific contributions is providing services and support to tenants 24-7. This is key to our success. LCO a aussi été sélectionné parmi les meilleurs employés. And we were selected amongst the best employers in the cap capital area for the third year in a row. So once again, congratulations to the team. Significant challenges the community has faced in 2020. While we are now working on our post-peak recovery plan, we are expanding our service delivery. We are committed to serving and make a positive difference in housing the most vulnerable every day. We are proud to say that we are more than a landlord, and we are grateful to you, our shareholder, City Council, the staff at the City of Ottawa, for your ongoing support in helping to make OCH better for the 32,000 tenants living with us. Au nom du conseil d'administration du personnel, on behalf of the board and staff, partners and renters, uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions uh, from uh, members of council? Councillor uh, McKenney, as our housing and homelessness liaison, would you like to comment? Oh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thanks to Stefan and, uh, and Councillor Fleury. Um, as you know, I also sit on um, the Board of Ottawa Community Housing. It's my um, second term. And um, the, the work that's being advanced by Ottawa Community Housing really across the city right now in terms of their, um, you know, uh, new capital uh, programs, uh, the new builds, uh, and the support to... Um, 
to their residents um, is is really quite uh, quite exceptional. I've uh, been involved in one way or another and uh, followed Ottawa Community Housing over a couple of decades, and uh, I can certainly attest to the fact that it has really. Um, it turned to its tenants for much of its guidance in terms of how um, we want people to be able to to live in uh, in the communities that uh, that we're responsible for. So, uh, uh, thank you to uh, all members of council and to those who also sit on the board. It uh, can be a, a, a tremendous amount of work at times, but uh, certainly uh, moves us in the direction that. Uh, that we need to be uh, going in and thank you to OCH staff um, tenants everyone involved uh, with the, the corporation thank you mr. mayor thank you uh, councillor McKenney councillor Brockington please thank you your worship and uh, thank you mr. Gigal for your presentation uh, in the interest of time I'll just get straight to my question in your written report on page 12 you talk about the integrated pest management uh, system that you have, and you note that last year there were 25,000 um, pest-related work orders submitted by tenants. That, to me, is is a very large number, and it's certainly one of the main complaints I hear from my tenant, from my OCH residents, is um, pest issues. Has OCH considered a mandatory spraying of every unit? Uh, in your holdings every year to get ahead of the pest issue. Thank you, Councillor, uh, for the question. Uh, we all know uh, that you know pest management uh, is uh, you know an issue that is facing uh, you know not only Ottawa Community Housing but many landlords across the city of Ottawa. Even now, as we all know, uh, public offices and spaces. Uh, in terms of the IPM approach and when we look at, you know, the number of visits, this is a collaboration between the tenants and Ottawa Community Housing. Uh, the aspect where we are looking at improving uh, the maintenance and being proactive, this is called what we, uh, we define as a proactive visit in our unit. We do that on a yearly basis. Uh, in fact, we have a team that they are specialized in IPM, and that's their role. Sorry, to Stefan, Stefan. Yes. Sorry, uh, there's still a member of council that uh, does not seem to understand. You've got to put the mute button on. So we'll just hold a minute till we... Sorry, Councillor Fleury. Councillor, we're hearing everything you're saying, so please push the mute, mute button. Mr. Mayor, it is not me. I'm alone in the chat. All right, who... Uh, just wait a moment. Someone has a bird. Okay, so just, just before we, we don't want to interrupt, Councillor Jaguar is answering Councillor Brockington's question. So, um, if you uh, are, if you're not on mute, now's the time to put yourself on mute. Yeah. Uh, it's Stefan here. Okay, go ahead. Can I go, Mayor? Uh, yep. Mr. Mayor? Go ahead. Yeah, good to go. Okay. Uh, no, just to mention that in terms of the IPM response, it's very important to recognize that, uh, you know, this is a partnership between the tenant and uh, the landlords. And for Ottawa Community Housing, this partnership uh, really is, uh, you know, uh, leveraging the team that we have in place. Uh, we do conduct uh, proactive visits in our units. Uh, unfortunately, in some cases, we do have what we call focal points. Those are the ones that uh, requires support from agencies and other groups to help individuals to achieve the cleaning and the maintenance required to facilitate the treatment and to be successful in our treatments. So again, this is a partnership. Uh, this is something that uh, I'm pleased to say that we have a lot of partners working with OCH to help our residents that they are the most vulnerable for pest management. Having said that, being proactive is a key element and I totally agree with you. Thank you. Anything else, Councillor Brockington? No, thank you, Mayor. Other members of council, questions or comments to Mr. Giguere or, or Councillor Fleury? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, it's uh, Councillor King, and I just yes. wanted to make a quick comment and a question. Go ahead. And Thank you. Um, 
So I'd, li- I'd really like to commend the work of Ottawa Community Housing, uh, being a new member of council and having served uh, a full year on, on the board. So I'd really like to commend the work of uh, Chair Fleury and also Mr. Jiguer and all of OCH staff who've been really working to improve uh, the tenant experience and engagement, uh, working on the redevelopment of communities such as uh, Rochester Heights, and also working to implement a diversity and inclusion table. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Jaguer to, to comment on uh, the new initiative around diversity and inclusion through the creation of this new table. Thank you, Councillor King. Uh, this is something that is very important for Ottawa Community Housing. Uh, Ottawa Community Housing, uh, we serve Bless you. Uh, We serve uh, 28 different languages uh, across our communities. Uh, We are uh, living uh, diversity and inclusion on a daily basis. So for us, it was very important that we engage in conversations and sometimes difficult conversations around uh, inclusion and ensuring that everyone has a voice and a comfortable space to discuss and really bring forward the corporation and be a leader as well in housing and in diversity and inclusion in Ottawa, but in the sector as well. So uh, the Champions Table is really there to enable employees, staff, tenants, stakeholders, shareholders to have a conversation around diversity and also to bring forward solutions path and also activities that will generate and develop the outcomes that we expect as an organization, but also as a collectivity. Thank you for that and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, anyone else uh, like to ask uh, Ms. Yes, yes uh, this is Councillor Kavanaugh. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you very much and uh, thank you, uh, Stefan, for the presentation and uh, thank you to Councillor Fleury for his leadership. Uh, uh, it's a privilege to work uh, work on the uh, with OCH. Um, I don't think people realize the fact that it's more than just being a landlord. Um, it, it has to do so much more, and um, and it is doing that with uh, not a lot of, of funding. Um, it, uh, it manages very well, especially the fact that we're moving ahead and building more. And I think that's a really important part of what OCH is doing is the fact that they are moving ahead. On, on creating even more housing and making plans to to uh, to make it um, a better feel because as our as the housing stock ages we've got a lot of work to do um, one of the uh, things that I think that a lot of people were concerned about in terms of just seeing um, uh, projects at OCH is um, is waste management and I'm really glad that it was put in the report on page seven talking about a strategy um, and I have talked to the city about this as well to ask them to work closely with OCH, and I'm just wondering if there's been any progress on that. So that's a question to me or the, to the chair? So I can take it, it's Stefan, so. Okay. Sure. Yes, okay. Uh, Yes, uh, we are progressing, and in fact, we do work in collaboration with the City of Ottawa. We have experienced over the last couple of years uh, improvement, uh, but also challenges, and I think you pointed it out out rightfully. And this is an area where, uh, in fact, the collaboration with the different stakeholders will be important. Uh, As we are moving on also in terms of diversion and as well a part of our Eco2 plan to ensure that we develop the proper behaviors with our residents, we're looking at providing also a curriculum and training to the residents to facilitate the transition over waste and diversion strategies, but also we need to have the proper bins and facilities in place, and that's where the collaboration with the city is crucial and important. Okay. Thank you very much, and I just want to uh, um, uh, repeat the uh, uh, the comments by my my fellow councillor uh, Ralston King um, on um, the efforts that are being made on equity, um, particularly um, in my role as uh, women and gender equity, but also in councillor mm-hmm. King's new role, um, and in terms of anti-racism, that um, I appreciate the efforts that are being made by OCH. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else uh, wish to have a question or comment to Stefan or uh, Councillor Fleury? So we have a a series of recommendations, recommendations one to five, uh, put forward by OCH. So on the recommendations as presented, 
Carried. 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 Adopt A. Any dissents? Okay. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Merci beaucoup, Stefan. Et merci. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much. So thank you very much to the chair. I wanted to uh, open my remarks today by reflecting on Friday's No Peace Until Justice Solidarity March. I took part in the march as an opportunity to listen and learn from residents, particularly those in the black community who so often feel mar marginalized or ignored. This march was historic not just for the number of people who participated, but for its impact on our community and on decision makers like us. I want to thank those who participated uh, for remaining peaceful and respectful of each other. It was a true sign uh, show of unity and solidarity. I also want to thank the organizers who, uh, with limited time and resources, organized a very successful march on Friday. Ce fut une marche historique pour bien des raisons, et je remercie. It was a historic uh, march for many reasons. I'd like to thank everyone for being respectful. To see that the vast majority of participants, at least in the area I was standing, were wearing masks. I also want to thank Councillor King, who, upon confirmation uh, from Council later today, will be taking on the new role of Council Liaison for anti racism issues and ethno cultural relations. I know that Councillor King will do a great work in this role. But that said, I want to reiterate that eliminating racism is a responsibility that falls on each and every one of us, not just one member of council. We must continue to work together as allies for our racialized communities towards school. Shortly, you'll be hearing from our city manager, Steve Kanalakis, about the city's reopening plan. Mr. Kanalakis and his senior leadership team have put a tremendous amount of work into the plan, and they are keeping the health and safety of our residents as a top priority. Since the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in March, residents have done an incredible job of following public health guidelines. Grâce au effort incroyable de notre communauté, thanks to the incredible effort made by our community, we managed to actually slow the spread of the virus in Ottawa. To the hard work and sacrifices of our community, we have flattened the curve and slowed the spread of the virus. While we must remain vigilant, the City of Ottawa is now cautiously resuming some programs and services with safety remaining uh, the top priority. This isn't a return to normal, but it is an important step. The City's plan is based on guidance from Ottawa Public Health, and it aligns with the province's plan to gradually relax emergency orders. Public health, community support, and economic recovery are all uh, connected. Our phased reopening plan prioritizes programs and services that promote a safe and strategic resumption of Ottawa's economic activity with ongoing support for Ottawa's vulnerable communities. On Monday, I was very pleased to hear Premier Ford's announcement that Ottawa is included in the regions that will be allowed to transition into Stage 2 of recovery starting on Friday. Last week, I had the opportunity to speak with the Premier to ask him to consider supporting a regional approach, and I'm very pleased that he's followed up on that suggestion. One of the services that many of our residents will be excited to see reopen is salons and barber shops. I've been advocating for this sector to reopen, as they already had in Gatineau since the beginning of the month, which created an unlevel playing field for Ottawa businesses. And I look forward to getting my hair cut at the same barber shop that John Willing of the Ottawa Sun, an Ottawa citizen, gets his hair cut done. And I, could think, uh, and I think I could hear a collective cheer from those professionals as well as their clients when the Premier made that announcement on Monday. Last week, I had a chance to speak with the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario Registrar and CEO Jean Major, and I advocated for fewer regulations and fees for expanded patios in order to help our restaurant owners make it through the summer. I was very pleased to see the AGCO's announcement on Monday that they would, in fact, allow restaurants to easily extend their patios at no fee and without requiring new permits. This is good news for restaurants and their employees, so, uh, so many of whom have been hard hit by the pandemic. It's also good news for residents who will be able to finally enjoy a meal on a patio while being reassured that the service is being, meeting physical distancing requirements and other public guidelines. I want to also thank city staff for quickly bringing forward a patio plan that is flexible and meets the needs of businesses and restaurants in these difficult times. In particular, my thanks to Councillor Tim Tierney, Chair of Transportation, who's worked with my office on this file. I also want to recognize the responsiveness and dedication that has been displayed by our staff in right of way uh, these last few days as they respond to a flurry of pa patio requests. 
As an example, I'm aware of a patio request that came to my office at 2.30 yesterday from a restaurant manager downtown, and within two hours, an appointment has been made by staff to be on site at 9 o'clock this morning. So congratulations to the right away team for such impressive service delivery during these very busy times. I know that uh, we get this uh, level of service and devotion from all teams at the City of Ottawa. Businesses that the province begins to reopen the economy, we are encouraging all business owners to review the, our business reopening toolkit, which we prepared in consultation with Ottawa Public Health. It's been deemed to be very helpful by those who have used it to plan their reopening, so I encourage everyone to visit ottawa.ca slash business toolkit. In fact, this morning my office received a very nice note from a, I don't know if it's a gentleman or a woman named Chris Watson, no relation, uh, who was part of economic development at Huron County. And uh, he or she wrote, my name is Chris Watson and I work with Huron County Economic Development. We had the chance to see your business reopening toolkit and quite frankly we loved it. And they wanted permission to distribute it to their uh, businesses, which of course we would be delighted that they share that uh, great uh, kit with. I also want to thank Councillor George DeRoos who organized a tour of several small businesses in his ward uh, who are working hard to keep their doors open and employees working. For example, well-known well entrepreneur Earl Stanley, many of you know from Stanley's Old Maple Lane Farm, is now offering picnic packages at his beautiful property while respecting the two-meter physical distancing. I was also pleased that as part of the second phase of this reopening plan, driving concerts will be allowed in parking lots. This approach is an innovative way to support Canadian artists and musicians who have been, doing, been, uh, been some of the hardest hit by this pandemic. And I want to thank Councillor uh, Leeper, our music uh, liaison, who uh, uh, met uh, uh, virtually with a number of members of the hip hop community uh, to talk about how they can be more uh, uh, integrated into our music scene here in the nation's capital. And given the circumstances, that may be the only form of live entertainment our residents have access this summer. So I hope that Ottawa special event organizers will jump on this occasion. An important part of the province's reopening plan uh, relates to children. As our economy gradually opens up and parents go back to work, they will need access to safe and reliable care for their children. Si uh, nous voulons que notre économie reprend les parents... If we want our economy to get going again, parents will need uh, care for their children. Yesterday, the City of Ottawa announced our new summer camp program, which has been modified in response to COVID-19 and the pandemic. Camp Summer Fun will begin on July 6 and will follow provincial guidelines and advice from OPH, including physical distancing measures and group sizes. Some of the, pre the preventative measures that will be put in place include smaller groups, screening protocols for campers and staff, the installation of plexiglass sneeze guards, and floor decals to mark physical distancing measurements of two meters. We're taking all possible precautions to make sure that our summer camps are safe. Recreation e-guide can now be viewed online at ottawa.ca slash summer camps. Registration for the camps will begin online only on Monday, June 15th at 9 p.m. I thought that was an error, but it's in fact at 9 p.m. I want to thank Dan Chenier and his team in Recreation, Culture and Facility Services for all of their work organizing these camps and for helping families as we make this transition. Un grand merci à toi et ton équipe. So a big vote of thanks to you and your team, Dan. Thank you. Who are counting on public transit to get around that starting this coming Monday, June 15th, non-medical masks will be required to board transit. I want to uh, thank uh, Chair Hubley and Vice Chair Cloutier, along with Mr. Manconi and his team for the great work on the city's transit recovery plan, which has led the way nationally and internationally. Many cities around the world have recently made face coverings mandatory. We happen to be the first, and uh, London, England followed suit, uh, who announced they also will require masks starting on June 15th. And although staff will have a few masks on hands, uh, hand at various stations, residents who do not own a, a mask should purchase one before Monday. I'd like to remind all those taking public transit that starting on the 15th of June, you'll be required to, to wear a mask to get on board. Continuing on the high degree of compliance from transit users to make the resumption of regular transit services work for everyone. And remember, if you wear a mask, you protect yourself and you protect others. 
Finally, I want to thank all of our city staff as well as our residents for their cooperation as we move into this reopening phase starting on Friday. This is an important step forward for our city, our residences and our businesses. Let's do this uh, together and let's do it right. I now ask Councillor Eglai, who's shown great leadership, along with Dr. Etches at Public Health for the tremendous work that they are doing uh, to uh, take over the meeting. Councillor Eglai, please. Merci. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, bonjour. Uh, good morning, everyone. The recent provincial decisions about beginning the phase two reopening plan highlight our need for a quick transition from overall isolation to living with COVID-19. It's important to note that even though this transition is happening, the virus is still in our community. And it's important to be wise when it comes to expanding our activities. Even though restrictions have changed, the way this disease spreads has largely remained the same. The risk of spreading COVID-19 still greatly increases when you are in close proximity to others, in an enclosed space with others, not engaging in proper hand hygiene, and not wearing a cloth mask in places where distancing is difficult. Also, the d disease continues to be far more dangerous for the elderly and the immune, oh, uh, immunocompromised uh, members of our population. Changes in government orders and policies do not change this. Therefore, it is vital that the public use this information in order to decide what activities they should partake in. The risks associated with different activities in different environments vary greatly. For activities that are considered higher risk due to lack of physical distancing or other factors, I encourage the use of cloth masks to help decrease the overall risk and help protect fellow residents. I trust that our community will make COVID-wise choices with the information available to them, and I encourage everyone to visit the Ottawa Public Health website to get the most up-to-date information about this pandemic. As things transition, I also want to reflect on the great successes we have accomplished during this pandemic. Your actions have greatly reduced the spread of this virus. Without your hard work, dedication and sacrifices, the spread of COVID would have been exponentially worse. I want to thank you all for that. These promising figures reiterate just how effective physical distancing, hand hygiene, staying home if sick and cloth mask use are at keeping this virus at bay. Now isn't the time to abandon these measures, but rather an opportunity to integrate them into our daily activities in order to remain COVID-wise. Thank you, and I turn it over to Dr. Etches. Uh, bonjour, good morning, Quay. I do have slides again, and so I will speak to the slide number that I'm on as we go forward. Um, I also want to thank uh, you, Council, for your interest in staying up to date. Merci de votre intérêt. Merci. Thank you for your constant interest in keeping up to date to, to continue to protect the community. You know, what is the current situation with COVID in Ottawa? Uh, it's good. All, all of the trends are positive. You know, the cases decreasing, hospitalizations decreasing, outbreaks decreasing. We're down to nine institutional outbreaks being reported today. Uh, you know, the case and contact follow-up that public health can do is timely. We're meeting those targets. Uh, the testing volumes are up. We're using the lab capacity that we have, and the percent of results coming back positive is down. So I think the, the one um, area that still stands out to me when I look at it is that we do have, of all the cases that are not in institutions, 32% uh, over the last week, we still cannot link to a known exposure. So no link to travel or to a confirmed case. So this is something we're keeping an eye on. I'm going to go on to the next slide, uh, three, which is a screenshot of a new dynamic tool that we're launching today. About one o'clock, I think the, the website will go live. Um, you know, it's been a, a, an important principle uh, that we follow to be transparent in the sharing of the data that we have. And so this tool is, is uh, a new way to add to the dashboard that we've had that is a bit more, um, you know, I I interactive. Uh, people can look at uh, different aspects of the data that we have about COVID in our community. And we'll continue to add to it. Um, it'll be updated daily. Uh, with more in-depth uh, look at more variables on a weekly basis. 
I'm going to go on to slide four, which notes that we are also delving deeper into our data. So we have been collecting information about income and race, uh, you know, we're gathering new uh, data on those who are infected by COVID-19 to understand how their race and their income has an impact on, on the risk of uh, contracting COVID-19. That um, enough information um, becoming available to to make some uh, you know proper analyses. We're doing this with the community. Uh, we know our First Nations Inuit and Métis partners uh, have, uh, you know, concerns about how information uh, about infections been used and, and uh, how their community has been impacted by, by pandemics over the years. And so, uh, again, also with other communities, we need to make sure that the analysis and the way the information is used is appropriate. So as we analyze uh, the data, we're trying to get uh, the opinion of the community about uh, the context behind and the impact of uh, uh, the data. Uh, we are most interested in uh, those, those deep interviews we do with each case to try to find out the sources of ongoing infection in our community. And, you know, that's changed. It used to be travel. It used to be close contacts with cases, institutional outbreaks. Um, and now we're down to a fewer number, and, and we're looking for any links to workplaces, for instance, where it's harder to physically distance or uh, in, in other settings where, where people may have challenges, whether it's housing or uh, congregate care. So this is the focus, uh, and um, it's tied to, to our testing strategy, which I'll get into. I uh, just want to touch, though, on slide five, which is, a, I think the modeling you know, provides a constant reminder to us, though we are following a, a really excellent trajectory of decreasing hospitalizations. Uh, if we do not maintain the physical distancing, we can see that change pretty quickly and definitely get into the range of uh, overwhelming our healthcare system. So this is still our goal is to keep the level at a manageable rate. Uh, and I appreciate uh, everyone understanding that and, and keeping that goal in mind. When it comes to the testing, uh, you know, we have uh, the Community Assessment Center is being well used. And our healthcare partners, uh, the Champlain Health Incident Regional Command, are also exploring additional ways to move that testing out into the community. So these are active conversations, working with community health centers and, and other, um, you know, other organizations to look at more options to be flexible uh, to move uh, the testing and make it more accessible. The targeted campaigns uh, that have been ongoing in, in um, congregate care settings are continuing, again, under the leadership of the Champlain Health Integration, or sorry, Incident Region Command, and, and that uh, is, is meaning that we are seeing testing happen in higher risk uh, retirement homes, in uh, group homes, in, in settings where uh, the risk assessment deems that there's a higher risk of transmission or uh, risk of uh, more serious outcomes if, if COVID uh, was introduced. The outbreak management approach uh, relates to my earlier uh, comments about the, you know, the focus of Ottawa Public Health in identifying any links or clusters of, of cases. And so uh, we do also work with our healthcare partners to make sure that uh, if, if there's a need to do expanded testing in a certain setting, that that can be arranged. So on the next slide, slide seven, this, this uh, is encouraging news to me that, that as, as we go forward, uh, in, and we have a trend here of two weeks of data, the, the week starting um, May 25th and the week starting June 1st or 2nd, uh, we, we need to be assured that the actions of, of all of us are going to still slow down transmission of the virus, even as we go back to work or go back to accessing services. And this is what we see, that the, the vast majority are maintaining physical distancing in indoor places, uh, which is excellent. Um, and, and, and the majority of people are now using masks in indoor places as well. And, and that may continue to grow. When you look across Canada at the trends, the trends are more and more people are using masks. 
Um, and hand washing, of course, also important. So I, I'm going to end by just noting uh, we're, we're very happy, you know, confident to welcome in stage two in Ottawa, uh, knowing that we're going to continue to have uh, this caution and this, this sense of needing to protect ourselves and others. And, and so it is in, in our hands, in all of our hands, it, it's been the actions of the people of Ottawa that have um, made this possible to continue to open up. Um, and we do want to emphasize uh, this sense of each person becoming informed and, and making their own judgments about what is uh, lower risk and, and focusing on, on certain principles. So we have had some feedback that with, with things opening up, it's, it's more confusing. What's allowed, what's not allowed. Um, sometimes it doesn't make sense what's open, what's not and, and to people. And so what I want to emphasize is the principles to follow uh, that point to what is lower risk have not changed. They are still the same. It is higher risk if you're indoors compared to outdoors. If you're in close proximity to others, for longer periods of time, if you're not wearing a mask, that's higher risk. If you're in larger gatherings, that's higher risk. You have a greater number of contacts. And so we're asking people to do their own risk assessment, to think about their own health as well and the health of the people they live with so that um, you know, it may not be that, that people who live with someone who has a risk for a severe outcome uh, is going to, to, to commence the same kinds of activities as somebody without that risk. So smaller is better, outdoors is better, uh, limiting the contacts that you have to the, the smaller not the number, the better, is still going to help, um, you know, and, and we need this kind of thinking as people make their own risk assessments uh, in stage two. So I, I you know, the, the role of Ottawa Public Health is, you know, going to continue to try to share the information about what's happening to keep people informed. You know, we have daily updates, so if things are getting off track, we'll let people know so they can adjust their behavior. Um, I do have a lot of confidence, uh, and I want to reiterate my thanks uh, to people for doing their part in protecting, uh, you know, death, and, 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 and uh, you know, th this is important. We, we don't want to lose any more people uh, in our community. Thank you very much. Merci. Great. Thank you, uh, Councillor Egli, and, and thank you, Dr. Etches, again, for the tremendous work that you're, you're doing and continue to do and remind us we're not out of the woods on this uh, by any, any uh, measure. Uh, so we'll now we'll hear from our city manager, uh, Mr. Kanalakis. Good morning, and thank you and your team for working long hours to uh, get us ready for, uh, obviously, Friday and uh, the work that continues to have to be done over the course of the next uh, couple of uh, days and weeks. Mr. Kanalakis. No, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for your words of support to the uh, staff. Um, we have literally hundreds and hundreds of staff who have been working uh, very hard um, over the last couple months, and now um, it, the pressure is really on to uh, move forward to um, open in a responsible way. And I want to cover today with Council um, the areas, the focus that we're paying attention to and a timeline of how we anticipate our services are going to um, uh, open, what we're doing for the public and what we're doing for uh, for our staff. And there are many people that have been involved. I want to thank the general managers who have been uh, incredible. Um, we've had uh, our task force leads, Nancy Greenfield, Will McDonald, Liz Marlin, Lila Gibbons, Isabel Jasmine, Sarah Rogers, and Claire Freire. And they've had hundreds of staff working on their teams to pull all this together. Of course, Pierre Poirier and his exceptional team in EOC, Pimmer and Andrea Lanche and uh, Jocelyn Turner, special mention to her, my office, Charlotte Logan, and Steve Box, who's been, um, who've been taking care of communications, and Steve been, has been taking care of coordinating, quarterbacking all of the products that have been coming in, and finally, uh, OPH and Dr. Etches, who have uh, been with us uh, along the way. Uh, the whole way, uh, guiding us in every step we take. I'm um, on slide number two. Today I'm going to talk about our immediate response. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. The slides are there for reference, and I'm just going to skip past that. I want to focus on our reopening plan, three particular areas, our safety, our services, and our people, and how we anticipate our next steps will unfold. Slide three. Um, they're a little behind on the slides here. Uh, could you change the slides, please? Yeah, the, the slides uh, are going up. They're a little delayed on Rogers as a time gap. Oh, okay. Um, 
So I'm on slide three. So the summary of our immediate response, we focused on our emergency operations center, uh, mobilizing and deploying our staff, closing our facilities, canceling programs, services, and large public gatherings. We took safety measures and staffing rotations for critical services, um, geared down our city facilities and assets. We mothballed a number of our, of our actual infrastructure. Staff, about 95% of our staff are working from home from their administrative buildings. We expanded online service offerings and we created our five task teams uh, that I talked about early so that we knew in advance we had to get ready for the future and not just focus on the immediate. So when I go to our uh, reopening plan, as just as a reminder, there were foundational conditions, public health, workplace safety, vulnerable populations, child care and transit that we see as critical to get the economy going again and our task teams were created in response to making sure those foundational conditions are moving forward. Uh, the next slide, slide number six. Um, the foundational conditions, you can see the, the boxes there and, and the, uh, the uh, actions we've taken under each one of those uh, foundational conditions, which were immediate, um, our immediate uh, response. Slide number seven, we broke up our re reopening plan in three phases, pre-recovery phase, which was March to June, uh, the recovery phase one, which is our restart, which is effectively happening now and into July, and then our recovery phase two, which is to augment our services, which you'll see uh, in August. Um, with respect to um, uh, our safety, um, there are uh, six areas that we focused on, facility uh, retrofits, uh, service delivery modifications, PPE and preventive measures, uh, screening protocols, cleaning and disinfecting protocols, and of course, the information and communication. And on slide 10, um, in terms of our facility retrofits, the things we're focusing on is reoccupancy water quality. We have to make sure that our water quality in our large facilities is, is fine for people to go back into it. We're, we've approximately uh, engineered approximately 110 sneeze guards. We've installed at 55 public facing counters and uh, where required at workstations and self-serve workstations. Um, we've, a, uh, we've got approximately 5,000 physical distancing signs, floor decals, and directional markings, which are to be installed before pre-occupancy of our uh, building. Uh, we're developing uh, site-specific protocols for people flow and pathways, lobby control, lineup, queuing, and elevators. And uh, we're installing disinfectant dis uh, dispensers in facilities and at public entrances. Slide 11, um, all of our uh, points of entry and exit will be limited to maintain social distancing. We're ensuring proper ventilation in our large buildings that meet industry guidelines and public health standards. Our outdoor spaces, we've installed park physical distancing circles and uh, cleaning and sanitization protocols for our outdoor washrooms. On slide 12, um, we focus on individual assessments and the city has taken a risk-based approach which requires individual assessments of each of the following um, in terms of uh, uh, risk of transmission through interaction and to identify uh, and potentially modify service delivery to ensure safety. So our service offerings, our staffing and facilities have been put through this assessment. Uh, we moved to virtual programming and online services for recreation, culture, facility uh, services, auto public library with their digital content and virtual book launches and events and of course uh, planning infrastructure and economic development move quickly in terms of uh, digital submission, which we're continuing of documents and applications, virtual meetings, and uh, digitalized um, uh, view of their plans, view and release. On slide 13, um, we've reduced um, for our, um, our program delivery, our recreation, culture, and facility services has reduced cohort sizes for programs and contact management. It requires additional staffing, facilities, and facility operational support. The Ottawa Public Library has moved to curbside uh, pickup of library materials, and uh, Service Ottawa and Employment and Social Services have created an appointment-based in-person counter services and telephone services and contactless document drop-off at all of our client service centres. And of course, our outdoor recreation, our citywide park ambassadors have been providing uh, guidance on physical distancing. On slide 14, on our PPE and preventive measures, uh, we prioritize PPE for healthcare and essential uh, worker roles. Uh, for cloth masks are preventative for all our staff or PPE is not required, but 
but physical distancing is not always possible. We're providing cloth masks to our staff, and the use of cloth masks is strongly recommended for members of the public where it's not specified as mandatory for the service like uh, transit uh, has done in the last in the last week. So we are not um, insisting that um, uh, staff or uh, the public wear cloth masks when they enter buildings, but we're strongly recommending it where they're not able uh, to physically distance. Uh, personal hygiene, staff are required to wash or sanitize their hands after handling paper, cards, shared tools, etc. We're providing hand sanitizer to them. And we're also um, uh, have created a hazard identification and risk assessment tool that guides management to ensure that all appropriate comprehensive, comprehensive combination controls are in place in all our work areas to reduce the risk of staff uh, to staff and clients. On page 15, we've initiated screening protocols. We've implemented a screening tool and requirement for all employees, including contracts to self-screening before they, rework, they report to any work site. This requirement is a minimum standard, and service areas that are deemed higher risk, like long-term care, have implemented additional screening pro- uh, measures, like long-term care and uh, paramedics, for instance. Client screening pro- protocols. Client screening will be based on risk assessment in specific service areas, and depending on the service area, protocols would include additional safety measures, like signage indicating not to enter if they don't feel well or symptomatic, and staff will have a short list of questions to ask members of the, of the public before accessing facilities and in-person services if necessary. Slide 16, cleaning and intervention is a, is a, cleaning intervention is a critical piece to this, and our logo here is keep it out, stamp it out, plan and manage. We're going to be uh, implementing site-specific cleaning protocols uh, with each facility to align with the uh, service delivery, so whatever the service is, we will align our cleaning regimen to, uh, to match the need. Uh, there will be enhanced cleaning scope, uh, minimum twice daily high contact touch point areas, and once daily full sanitization service in addition to the ongoing site-specific monitoring cleaning throughout the day. And our staff have also been researching emerging technologies such as electrostatic sprayers, foggers, and uh, misters and uh, health and safety product protocols uh, for confirmed and probable cases and safe return to service have been developed and are implemented. Information and communication. Um, we have a detailed communication strategy and council and the public would want to see that the day after council. We're launching uh, a, a lot of material on our website uh, and all our uh, channels, social media channels um, and in print. Um, to ensure that there's uh, dissemination of the public information we're presenting today relating to service uh, resumption, including the safety protocols and modifications to our city services. So there will be FAQs, uh, Qs and As for staff, management guide handbooks. Uh, counselors will get a full package in terms of uh, all the things they need to know. Um, so we are we are doing a full court press on communication so people understand what the expectations are and what the city is doing proactively. Uh, employee and facing information and communication. Um, there's going to be regular updates will be shared with staff about the work from home program, redeployment, health and wellness policy, safety controls, wellness and training. And each service, because we have 105 different service lines in the city, will have to modify and customize their services to fit within the framework of the guidelines that we're putting out. So the new, uh, the new uh, client experience is going to be about physical distancing measures on slide 18, hand sanitizer stations, face masks, uh, highly recommended or required with transit, protective screens, frequent and thorough cleaning, and instructional signage. That is going to be the typical client experience as people enter any one of our facilities or uh, is on, are on any of our infrastructure. So I'd like to now focus on our uh, reopening plan, and uh, I'm on page 20. The first phase, and I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through this, but slides 21 to 24 is basically a list of city services that were maintained throughout March to June. We had to adapt, we had to move quickly. We briefed council on this every two weeks in terms of where we're at. But this entire period, March, uh, April, uh, May, and uh, now uh, part of June, uh, we were able to uh, maintain uh, the services on these slides on page 21, uh, 22, 23, and 24. It was a remarkable effort that staff were still able to uh, maintain all these services, primarily most of them working from home, but we had a lot of staff that were still um, on the ground, on the ground delivering services uh, in, uh, in real time on site. I'd like to turn to, to um, 
slide 25 and just talk about that you know the the other part of the maintaining and adapting our services were also part of the provincial directives. As you recall, we were adapting almost weekly to uh, provincial directives and adjusting our services. And you see, on, see on, on 25, some of the things we had to, if you recall, emergency child care was implemented, community gardens were open, beaches uh, were, uh, were opened, uh, not the water, but the, uh, the parks, park ambassadors, boat launches and docks, sports courts. Uh, we had to move on all those things, off-leash dog uh, enclosures, skate parks. Uh, the library was uh, quick to implement uh, at a number of locations, curbside library pickup. Our elections office uh, is going to be up and running uh, soon. And then we're talking about um, splash pads and, of course, um, um, uh, ball diamonds and sports fields of uh, groups of 10 or less for training only. And we believe that's going to be... Um, uh, both of those things are going to be implemented mid-June because we still haven't received the, uh, the provincial safety requirements. We just received the notice on the 8th. We're waiting now for the provincial guidelines and specifics before we can uh, actually open the splash pads, ball diamonds, and sports field. So on slide 27, in terms of what's restarting as we come, the, the issue for us is that the province announced a number of things on June 8th, but we do need now, if you recall, we, uh, we laid off, uh, we put on a special emergency leave of almost 4,200 employees. Those 4,200 employees are normally, a number of them are the ones that restart and, and change seasonal activities, particularly for recreation and a number of other activities that we do, and so and culture. And so um, now the process is, is ramped up in terms of bringing back people, uh, reconfiguring our service areas and ensuring that we're able to deliver services within the provincial guidelines. So there is a lot of logistics and planning going on right now and communication, staff training, staff uh, staff uh, redeployment to get people back to be able to do this. And so what you're seeing is there is a, going to be a bit of a lag from the announcement on June 8th um, to end, and uh, you'll see a number of these services from when we're actually up and running these services. There has to be. We need some time to, uh, to get organized and make sure that it's safe for employees and for the residents who access our services. And these next slides give you a sense of... Um, what we're, we're restarting and when. And if we can do it earlier, we're going to do it earlier. And if we can do it incrementally on a regional basis, the mayor was uh, asking me about that the other day. He says, can't we take a sort of the provincial approach to regionalization? Can we start doing east, west, south, core? Can we start rural? Can we start opening things at least in a, in a protracted way earlier if we start at least getting some facilities opening up in the different areas? And I think that's a good idea. And, and uh, we're looking at those things to make sure that we can cover uh, the entire area with some services as we bring everything back online. But you can see on slide 27, counter services will be by appointment only, and so we're opening that up at uh, July 6th at Ben Franklin Place in City Hall, getting uh, all that those facilities ready. Our summer camps, as Dan has put out his memo, there's a, a reduced registration up to 37 locations, and we'll be ready by July 6th to uh, uh, launch that. Our employment and social services and housing services rent supplement office will have reduced hours and will allow counter document drop off and we're going to have four sites for that and that will be recommenced in July 6th. We'll see transfer sales and information center at the Rito Center. We're still um, awaiting uh, to see when the Rito Center um, uh, opens in terms of the public uh, spaces, the lobby, so that's still to be confirmed. Our beaches, uh, we need to rehire our lifeguards. We need to do water testing, get all that training recertified, make sure everybody's ready to go at Mooney's Bay, Westboro, and Petrie Island. And we're hoping uh, to be up by uh, July 6th. That's our plan. Our playgrounds, which include all amenities, including uh, play structures citywide, we expect to be in, in July, but we're waiting for provincial authorization for that. We still don't have that, and we think it'll take four days after the provincial authorization uh, to be able to uh, to uh, open all that up safely. Uh, Stay neuter clinic will be up by appointment only starting on July 6th. Inspections and enforcements for building, fire, parking, property standards, tobacco will recommence July 6th. Uh, committee meetings July 6th and child care centers. Um, we're thinking right now, I've been advised by uh, Donna Gray, that uh, all locations 10 citywide uh, were targeting from mid-July to be confirmed on when we can open um, those centers. Um, on page 29 now, the, the province uh, on, as I said, uh, 
uh, announced additional services to open on June 12th, and that's where there's going to be a bit of a lag. So our indoor pools, except wave pools, outdoor pools and waiting pools, museums, art galleries, and community centers for non-recreation services, we're looking at that hard right now. There's a lot of work in terms of how quickly we can get that uh, up and running. We're hoping in the next couple of weeks um, that we'll be running, in fact, um, up before, uh, before July. That's the uh, target, but there's a lot of work to be done obviously, to uh, to get those facilities, that infrastructure re- reinstated. Um, on slide 20, uh, on slide 30, uh, ball diamonds and sports fields, we've asked a lot of questions about that. For competitive play, um, citywide, we're expecting August 4th or two weeks following the provincial authorization. So if we get provincial authorization in the next little while, we need a couple weeks to get that uh, that organized. As you know, the province has, has um, increased the number of people that can gather together, and not only family, but uh, 10 to 10 people. So that changes um, some of the dynamics in terms of the lease for training and the use of our, spe- our fields. Our fall clean, the capital, we expect to uh, commence August 4th. Inspections and enforcements with bylaw on August 4th. Uh, transit recovery plan and the fall service changes. We expect August 30th, which John has already talked about. And then our CPR and um, uh, training um, uh, and our defibrillator training uh, for essential worker training of groups of four or less will com- recommence August 4th. So that in a, in, a, in a whirlwind is where our services are. There'll be detailed information, as I said, coming out on that to uh, members of the public and council. And uh, you'll start to see uh, things coming back over the next couple of weeks. I want to spend a couple of minutes now on slide 32 talking about our people because without our people being safe and uh, able to come back to work, we can't deliver the services. And so we focused on a number of areas, our safety, work from home program, our redeployment plan, employee health and wellness, training and uh, union collaboration because they've been our partners along the way. I'm on slide 33 now. On our health and safety uh, policies, as I said earlier, we developed a comprehensive uh, health and safety policy with associated guidelines, um, self-screening for employees, contracts and clients, PPE, personal hygiene standards, cleaning and sanitizing, physical distancing guidelines. All of these things are documented and are part of the uh, manual we've created uh, for our employees and for our management. Uh, safety controls, uh, personal and protective equipment, including cloth mask requirements to supply for our staff. And we're requiring employees to wear cloth masks where physical distancing or other controls are not possible. And we're going to ensure that employees are trained online and informed, all of them, on the new safety protocols and standards. Work from home, approximately uh, 90% of the city's administrative employees are working from home uh, in a remote environment during the pandemic. And we uh, are going to be directing that the majority of these employees, other than in the, uh, the specific situations determined by the general managers and the various services, will continue to work home until after Labor Day or until up to Labor Day. Um, and so we will be directing all our staff who are currently working from home unless specifically directed otherwise to continue doing so uh, while we uh, spend the summer months, the next couple of months, further assessing our facilities, making sure the retrofits are in place, including workstation and floor designs, to make sure that people can come back in an orderly fashion. And for instance, we don't flood Constellation with thousands of, of employees coming through that front door uh, in the morning and the afternoon and crowd our floors. So we are taking a very um, a system, uh, systematic approach to ensuring that people that do return to our administrative buildings do it in a safe, orderly way, and it's coordinated uh, organizationally, politically. And so we need those couple months to make sure that can happen. So we're asking our employees to continue working from home, and we know that's not easy for everybody. A lot of people want to come back. Uh, we're developing new guidelines and policies and supports for people that are working from home. Our management need new tools. We want to make sure we're checking in our employees. We're given a work-from-home toolkit we've developed. We're giving leadership tools for managing, supporting virtual teams. These are new skills our managers have to learn, and they have to learn them fast. Uh, we're supporting outcome-based objectives. How do you keep track that people are actually doing their work uh, from home? So we're, we're putting in measures and, and tools for people to do that. And we pro- we're providing all employees with the technology supports and collaboration tools. Our IT department did an amazing job the first month getting uh, hundreds and hundreds of computers out to our staff so they can continue working. Our redeployment plan on slide 36, um, we developed a um, uh, uh, 
what, called for wide rede- uh, redeployment program. If you recall, we didn't have a, a lot of employees who were uh, actually um, not working directly in their job or couldn't work. But we ended up re- redeploying hundreds of staff uh, to Ottawa Public Health, long-term care, our shelters, fleet services, emergency response, and the Park Ambassador Program. And we anticipate they're going to remain in these roles until they're no longer required uh, to support all the needs that we have related to COVID. And we'll be uh, monitoring and responding to new requests uh, for staff as we see the different surges happening in different service areas. We need to stay nimble and move uh, move people around. Um, and our unions have been collaborating with us on that very well so that we ensure that our service doesn't decline where we need it most. On slide 37, our health and wellness of our employees, uh, we've expanded our uh, employee and family assistance program. Um, we're promoting uh, expanding. Uh, uh, we've expanded that. We've expanded our counseling services. We have targeted uh, webinars, uh, new training, online wellness resource library. Uh, we've updated our return to work and leave accommodation practices. We've expanded our internal peer support programs. We're up to da- updating our ergonomic uh, program, including virtual tools. A lot of people are working in makeshift offices at home with dining room tables, and, and, and it's not sustainable long-term in terms of our employees' health. And we're revising our mental health training. A ton of work has been happening by our human resources uh, group in terms of putting in the supports um, under the leadership of Valerie uh, Turner and, um, and Liz Marlin to put in the support for our staff so they can remain productive and healthy while they're working uh, in the various conditions that have changed for them. Training, uh, we're updating our mandatory training and maximizing our online delivery. Uh, we're supporting the new uh, COVID uh, with new training such as safety protocols, use of PPE, cleaning and sanitizing, work refusal procedures, managing remote teams. So they are revamping an entire training program right beneath their feet to ensure that staff have that available uh, for their use and management have that available for their use. So we are we are turning uh, turning the ship around um, literally 180 degrees um, to get ourselves uh, uh, operating within this new reality. And I want to thank our union on slide 39, our unions, GP503, uh, CIPP, IATC, uh, ATU, um, they've been uh, they've been fantastic in terms of working with us and ensuring that you know what we can maintain services and they've been nimble they've been flexible uh, they have not been over bureaucratic uh, they've been they've been giving us a lot of room uh, to support our staff and we've been working very collaboratively with them to meet their needs and I think that's a testament to the relationship we have with our union leadership in terms of our next steps um, page 41 I know council is uh, actually waiting to hear where we are on the status of our finances. Wendy uh, Stephenson, our CFO, was working hard with her team, and uh, we're working hard with the uh, general managers. In fact, we have a number of upcoming meetings. We're reviewing in detail our financial uh, uh, situation and possible mitigation strategies that we're assessing. Um, the um, the uh, work in terms of uh, uh, reopening our service and our safety also have a cost. And uh, there's going to be a cost because we have to take other measures like businesses have to do in terms of putting in safety protocols. And those things cost money and it's going to impact our bottom uh, bottom line and probably increase our forecasted deficit. The plan is uh, we are committing to bring to June 24th council meeting a detailed financial report with the status of our finances and the mitigation measures that uh, we are recommending to council to try and close the gap. Um, We have implemented numerous uh, cuts cut and reduce spending in non-essential services um, exercises and, and uh, initiatives already. But the reality on page 42, slide 42, is that, you know, the SCM and LUMCO and, um, have requested to the federal and provincial government a $10 billion backstop. And, and the first step, they've announced a gas tax accelerated uh, payment, which, you know, that's not new funding. It helps a little bit with cash flow, but it does not help our bottom line. The city requires the backstop funding to provide the resources and continue with their essential services because without it, there will be service program and project impacts impeding our uh, success for economic recovery and impeding our ability to deliver the services the way we know it today. So without some kind of uh, backstop from the federal provincial government, the city of Ottawa will be in a position where we will have to rethink a number of our services and council uh, will be engaged in that discussion. On page 43, uh, our legislative agenda, I know that we 
had a big plan for the year or next year. We are reviewing the legislative agenda in detail um, uh, and looking at, at what can be accommodated, what might have to be modified, deferred, changed, and we're making that assessment uh, right now. We're, we're getting very close to completing that, and we'll be reviewing that with the committee chairs and ultimately with the committees um, in terms of uh, their respective agendas going forward. And the city strategic plan is the other big piece of work um, that uh, you know I was happy to uh, put through council for council to approve um, in uh, earlier in this year. It's the the work plan for the next uh, uh, several years of council, and the um, the um, uh, strategic plan too is being reviewed in terms of what priorities have to be deferred, what uh, can be uh, what can be uh, has to be put off or not done right now. What can we afford? It's all interlinked with our financial picture and the capacity of the organization, and that, too, uh, will be coming back to council in terms of our recommendations of uh, what changes, if any, have to be made to the, uh, to the strategic plan to reflect our new reality. Um, and so that concludes my presentation. Man, I'm sorry that I went on longer, but the, this is a culmination of uh, weeks and weeks of work. And as I said, um, uh, I've, I've, I've moved quickly through this presentation, but you will get a comprehensive package of communications materials um, uh, coming uh, to all of council and to the public uh, this afternoon right after council meeting. So you will have all the material you need. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you very much for that um, thorough presentation. Uh, Councillor Aglai, uh, with respect to uh, children's playground uh, equipment, I think you have a point on that to Dr. Etches. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dr. Etches, we've heard in uh, phase two that splash pads and waiting pools will be allowed to be open, but not uh, not play structures and parks. Uh, a lot of people in the community have reached out and and are would like to know why that distinction has been made. Um, I appreciate that the province makes these decisions, but do you think you could um, shed some light on why that decision may have been made by the province at this time? Uh, thank you, Councillor. I I did not. I do not know the rationale of a provincial decision, but I can imagine there were a couple of elements that made a difference. So what, one being the importance of having access to cooling centers and ways to cool down as we enter the summer and there's, there's a risk of heat uh, warning. Uh, the other being the difference between a play structure which is never washed and cannot be clean. Mr. Mayor, can I? Uh, there's a speaker that gives a really bad uh, sound back. I wonder if. Yeah, I think uh, we, uh, this, uh, I don't know if it's the same person who does not seem to understand how to put the mute button on. Uh, we keep hearing a bird. If anyone has a bird, you're the one without a mute. So can we please, uh, because it's very difficult to hear Dr. Etches. So there's, there's two aspects, I think, the province has uh, considered. One would be the, the need to look at uh, options for people when it's very hot out through the summer, and so uh, splash pads can, can help address that concern. Um, the other is that play structures cannot be washed or cleaned, uh, but the water, uh, you know, may may help, uh, you know, rinse virus away, for instance, on, on a splash pad. And and so I, I I just imagine these are a couple of elements that make it, um, you know, likely that there's a difference between a play structure and a splash pad. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. So we'll just go down uh, the list. If you don't have a question or comment, just simply say pass. Uh, Councillor King. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have just a brief question, and I want to really thank uh, OPH for all the work that it's been giving in terms of, of advice. I'm just wondering about if there can be a brief description of the actions that OPH will be taking um, as the city moves towards uh, stage two reopening. So Ottawa Public Health is reviewing our own programs and services. Cl clearly we have some uh, core work that can't be suspended uh, forever. Uh, some of the work we do is in support of businesses. So um, we have a team that's um, advising, providing guidance, uh, answering questions to businesses that want to open. Or, 
Uh, we also have inspectors that are out, um, it, you know, it, able to help food premises and pools open in a safer manner. Um, we need to, to take a look at our immunization strategy and making sure there are options for people to catch up. Uh, so we have a, a review just like the city um, ha has done in, in terms of how to uh, restart some of the services that have been on pause in a safer way. And uh, we won't be able to do all we would like to do because most of our team is still re deployed working on the COVID response, um, but we're calibrating that as the uh, number of cases drop, the outbreaks drop, we're able to, uh, to look at other work. Um, you know, the communications channels and the advice to, to businesses, uh, that, that workload continues to, to grow, uh, and so we'll, we'll be focused on those aspects as well. Uh, does that answer your question, Councillor? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate that because it's not just uh, the work during, obviously, global pandemics, uh, which is the mandate uh, for uh, uh, the uh, public health agency, but it's also the, the, the good work that the uh, public health agency does in, in regular times that's absolutely important to our community and actually, actually you know, reaffirms in our mind the, the value of having a locally-based, city-based uh, public health agency. So thank you so much for, for that answer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Councillor DeRuz? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I don't have a lot of questions, but I just want to thank uh, Dr. Hs, and I want to also thank uh, the city manager for this uh, thorough and very, very important presentation that we have today, and, and that make us, uh, put us in a very good place to feel slowly opening the city, and I also want to thank your leadership, and thank you yesterday for coming out to my ward and promoting our small businesses. Uh, first step for us to be able to open our city. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Harder, please. Thank you. Uh, because of the good work, people are thrilled. That's all I have to say, sir. All right. Thank you, Councillor Conseil Cloutier. Mute button, Councillor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Schindler, no, thank you, no questions. Thank you to the city manager and to Dr. Richards for their uh, continuing work for our community. Thank you, Councillor Cloutier. Councillor Gower, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question for Dr. Etches. You mentioned that there's obviously still cases in the community that can't be directly traced back to other cases. And uh, there was a, a media report today in Southern Ontario that there's a uh, looking at demographics, seems to be a, a higher or increasing number of, of younger people who are testing positive. I was just wondering if there's any, any patterns in terms of demographics and ages that you're seeing in Ottawa with the, uh, with the continuing increase in cases, if you're noticing any, any trends there. Uh, so that information is available on our website. We've, we've um, made it public, the breakdown by age group, and I have not, uh, I've been looking at that, and I have not seen a trend for a greater proportion of cases coming from younger populations, say in their 20s or 30s. Uh, it seems fairly uh, well distributed across uh, the age range, um, and so I haven't seen that yet, but you're, you're right. These are things that we need to look at as a clue uh, if more people are getting back to work in those age ranges, uh, for instance, you know, if there's some uh, risk associated with that, you know, that's one way we can look at picking that up. Okay, thank you very much. No further questions for me. Thanks, Councillor Yard. Councillor Luloff, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a few questions to staff. Um, do we have a plan for our seniors uh, in the east and west ends of the city who have no way to get to our testing centers, both of which are located centrally at this time. Uh, this vulnerable population is most at risk, and many have expressed frustration that there are no testing centers in the suburbs. Is that work being done um, to have uh, mobile units to help fill this gap? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the feedback that we're getting on uh, barriers to accessing uh, current testing centers is being forwarded to the Champlain Health uh, Incident Region Command. And that, um, that is something that they're looking at. It, you know, mobile options, options based in different neighborhoods uh, who may face more barriers. Uh, so there, there is a mobile option right now for seniors who are not able to, to get out. Um, it, it's a access through referral from a healthcare provider. Um, so if somebody's 
family doctor is not uh, offering the testing for COVID-19, um, then the, a referral can be made to that mobile service as well. Okay, great. And I just also want to thank you guys uh, for your work with increasing uh, accessibility of the current two centers and kind of back and forth uh, with your office and the accessibility office on that. So thank you for that. Uh, do you have any advice for residents who have family that live outside the municipality that have been taking proper precautions uh, and wish to visit uh, in order to help young parents uh, working from home without childcare? We're at a point now where immediate family, are we at a point now where immediate family can, you know, quote unquote, bubble as we've seen in other provinces as long as all precautions continue to be observed? Thank you for raising this because it, it's of real importance to families' well-being um, to be able to meet with family members and have support. I think we're in an interesting and awkward time where um, we are opening up some services and, and the message is still that uh, growing our household bubble uh, is is not not yet um, welcomed or being promoted by the province uh, because it's that close contact that poses the risk of transmission. Um, I just saw a news article today in, in British Columbia that a family gathering it was it was a bit larger, but it, it led to transmission because it's the kind of contact where people are in close contact that that you know provides more opportunity for transmission. So as the province has opened up the idea that you can gather in groups of 10, they're still recommending physical distancing if, if it's not with your household members. So I, I know that is a hard one um, to, to sometimes get our heads around. So what I'm adv advocating is that people uh, apply the principle of just limiting your contacts as much as possible, especially your close contacts. So even if you're going to go out and have a group of 10, you know, try to make sure it's not a different group of 10 every day, but you limit your contact. And, and for those families who are interested in supporting, you know, different generations with child care, you know, I, I can understand, um, you know, thinking about how to proceed along those lines because we're opening up private child care you know, uh, and, and city funded and, and other childcare options on Friday. So I think these are the things that individual families will need to take a look at the risks um, and, and make their own decisions. Uh, older adults are at greater risk of, of more severe outcomes and, and even death. And so that is one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I think there's been extra caution around grandparents and grandchildren. Um, so, you know, each family needs to think about balancing the risks and what's the best options for them with the principle of the fewer contacts, the better. I hope that's, that's really, helpful. that's incredibly helpful. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Etches. Um, what further communication pieces at this point are planned at this time uh, to provide further advice to our local businesses and especially restaurants uh, looking uh, for clarity and, and very specific advice on their operations as part of reopening. I'll note that in, additional, in addition to the general advice that we've provided in our toolkit, which is wonderful, and you know, I appreciate the work of Councillor Eglai, or sorry, Councillor uh, Eli Alshantiri and, uh, and, and Dudas on this, um, Toronto has provided interim advice to businesses on equipment and procedures. Uh, is, there, is there any plan to do the same uh, for the City of Ottawa? Uh, yes, we're going to continue to work very closely with our, our City of Ottawa uh, colleagues supporting businesses. Uh, so beyond the business toolkit, we are uh, providing more specific advice, for instance, around restaurants that want to open outdoor patios. And you get into a lot of questions about can there be a roof, can there be umbrellas. So we are getting into the nitty-gritty details and um, providing uh, some, some recommendations back. Um, so that people people want to open in the safer you know the safest manner manner possible, and, and we really appreciate that, and and um, you know we'll we'll be supporting and answering questions that come to us. O Ottawa Public Health isn't isn't an approver. Uh, you know we're not we're not um, you know you know anticipating the and it's not our role to go out to each site and actually approve a plan, um, mm -hmm. but to support people to do the right thing. That's awesome. And I guess I'll take the opportunity to remind uh, members of the public to ensure that uh, you're uh, very polite uh, and understanding with our servers. I'm sure they're just as nervous as the rest of us, so try to be kind. Uh, I've got one last uh, question. 
Um, this one, I suppose, is for Mr. Chenier. Uh, what will reopening our pools and beaches look like? You know, I'm happy to hear that uh, the projected timeline of, of July 6th, and I know that there's so much work to be done before then, but I'm wondering if you could give us a glimpse um, because the guidelines on gatherings are still 10 or less. So are we looking at capacity limitations like the ones imposed on places of worship, the 30% rule? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'll start with beaches. Uh, the, the plan for beaches is not drastically different than in prior years. We will perhaps be uh, a week later than usual opening the beaches, but we're in the process of training lifeguards. Uh, at some sites, we've painted the distancing circles. Uh, Mooney's Bay got them last week. They were refreshed today, and we are looking at Britannia for later this week. Um, and so, for the most part, it will be business as usual. The, the support buildings and canteens uh, will be open uh, for takeout only in the case of the canteen. Uh, with respect to the pools, we, even though the province announced uh, that they could open, uh, we have yet to see the regulations that apply to them. We expect and have been told to, to anticipate uh, some reduction in the capacity for, for each session of the uh, public swimming, for example. Uh, and so we're awaiting those in order to be able to understand uh, how to best structure uh, public access to the facilities and, to, uh, and how many swimming sessions we will offer. Uh, we are in the process now. All of the pools had been essentially mothballed, emptied uh, while, uh, while this was going on. We will start to reactivate uh, pools probably in a phased uh, fashion so that uh, and bringing the staff back to lifeguards and part-time staff that are involved in pool operations. Uh, we may have some uh, ready by July the 6th, but probably not all uh, in, in terms of uh, trying to find some geographic uh, service in every area of the city as best possible. So we're very early planning stage and the critical piece is we'll be receiving the provincial regulations that are going along with this. Thank you. You guys are all doing a wonderful job. Uh, one very last quick point. Um, with our parks reopening, um, we, we need to remind residents that, you know, uh, this, is, this, is, this is not a garbage can. I've received several complaints about how people uh, are, you know, throwing their garbage all over the place at Petrie Island. This is an ecologically sensitive area, so we need to make sure that we're living together responsibly. So I know our park staff are working very hard uh, emptying garbages, but a reminder to our residents, uh, to please act responsibly when you're social distancing in our parks. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Hubley, please. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. I, I'd like to echo my colleagues' uh, appreciation for Dr. Etches and her work on this and Mr. Kanalakis' team for how they're helping us, uh, helping all the residents get through this pandemic. Uh, I'll follow up on... Um, uh, Councillor Lulov's question about the, the garbage. It's a, a big issue uh, in my ward as well, where we're seeing um, household waste being dumped in uh, bus uh, shelters and uh, uh, park garbage cans. And staff are doing their best to try to keep up with emptying those cans, uh, yet there's no, there seems to be uh, not enough of an enforcement effort put into this because I'm going to remind uh, uh, folks that we made changes to the green bin program so that dog waste and things like that that were filling up those waste bins in parks could be redirected to the green bin. We had a plan at that time to put green bins in the park. Could staff please update me on where we're at with this and what steps we're taking to get household waste out of these cans? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's Kevin Wiley. Um, for this first question, uh, the parks recycling, green bin in parks and recycling in parks is part of the solid waste master plan and we'll be coming forward um, uh, I believe in Q4 this year to uh, report on some of the details there, phase two. And uh, with the enforcement, uh, our solid waste inspectors do work with bylaw and enforce where they can. Thanks. Uh, so just to follow up on that, uh, Mr. Wiley, can I get uh, some kind of a report or, or numbers from you as to what that enforcement has looked like? How many tickets have been issued? Uh, uh, what kind of monitoring is going on? Please. 
Mr. Mayor, we can get that information for the councillor. That would be great. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's my question. Great, thank you, Councillor Hubley. Councillor Dudas, please. And I think you have a direction to staff as well. I do have a direction to staff. I do have one question, though, that I might uh, I might pose first. The uh, federal government announced on, I think it was Friday, that they're going to be offering provinces $14 billion. And then some of that money may be uh, allocated towards infrastructure, community programs, which would include public transit for municipalities. I'm just wondering, is there any anticipation that we will see any of that money trickle our way, or are there um, some obstacles with that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's the Mr. Mayor, uh, hang on a minute. Sorry. It's uh, Steve Kenlakis. Um We don't have any further information on um, on um, uh, the premier basic amounts that you know to start. I think there's still discussions with the premier, Mr. Mayor. You might be in a better position based on uh, the, uh, the groups you're involved in with the other large urban mayors um, to comment on it. But so far, the staff have not heard anything from at a staff level. I'm happy to take it offline and, and discuss further. I just, you know, anytime there's going to be money available to us to uh, recover from this, we, I want to make sure we tap into it, of course. Um, maybe I'll, so I do have a direction to staff, and then I've had the privilege of working with staff on uh, coming to this direction. And it really speaks to the fact that although we had uh, a policy and initiatives in place to virtually engage with our residents in, in public consultations and, and town halls and virtually, it had been done so more ad hoc until the pandemic hit. Then once the pandemic hit, we were almost forced as a society to take up virtual engagement. So there's been a lot of lesson learned from you know myself and I, I suspect other counselors and our staff in terms of how to engage with the community in a virtual format and what works. And you know, I, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm assuming others have seen that we're we're engaging people we've never seen before who are now, you know, in the comfort of their own home, able to tune in to a virtual consultation or a meeting. So city staff, we actually our city had a strategic priority uh, titled the Public Participation and Engagement Project. And that was just about to commence when this all struck. And it was really to, to pilot some of these, these innovative technologies to look to what best practices work. So my direction, I will read it, really plays on that and takes into account what lessons can we learn because of the pandemic. So my direction is that staff be directed to review the strategic priority, public participation and engagement project to address how the pilot project will respond to the new normal in the municipal context of public engagement and how physical distancing considerations will imp implemented as a long-term city requirement and report back to the Finance and Economic Development Committee with recommendations for an amended project scope and work plan to address these new realities no later than Q3 2020. So agreement on the direction. Great, okay, thank uh, you. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, who was that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Anything else, Councillor Dudas? No, thank you very much. And oh, just okay. one more thing. I'm in absolute awe of the work that staff has done to get us through this so far and to prepare us to get to the next stage. So thank you to Steve Kay and your whole team and to Vera and your team. Great. Just to follow up on your question with respect to funding from other levels of government, uh, LUMCO, the Large Urban Mayor's Caucus of Ontario, had a meeting, a virtual meeting, uh, this week with three ministers. Uh, raising the issue again of our need for uh, support from the two other orders of government because obviously we can't uh, fill the, the, the gap of uh, increased costs as a result of pa the pandemic uh, just based on property taxes. And then the Big City Mayor's Caucus met this week with Bill Morneau, the Finance Minister. Uh, we don't have a, a commitment obviously from either order of government at this point. Sometimes we feel like we're a bit of a the, uh, the ping pong ball back and forth between the federal government and the provincial government, but the reality is we need uh, their support because we're incurring significant costs and we're, as we've been told by our treasurer, we're losing a million dollars a day and uh, we have to get uh, ridership back up. Uh, we have to ensure that programs that we um, offer are available so that revenue starts coming in, but that's not happening anytime soon. 
So we'll continue to work with our organizations, the Feder Federation of Canadian Municipalities and uh, Councillor Tierney as our rep there and uh, the AMO board with uh, Councillor Brockington as our, our rep. Uh, so I, I continue to take an active role with BCMC and, and LUMCO, uh, but we don't have any news to report at this point, but we continue to press both uh, the federal and provincial governments that this is a, an urgent need and we need their support uh, sooner than later. Uh, Councillor Sides, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no further questions. There's been some, some great uh, questions asked. Uh, I would also, though, like to echo my thanks. Uh, this has been a real uh, team effort um, from a staff perspective and OPH, and, and I really just can't uh, express my gratitude enough. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Menard, please. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Luloff asked a, a lot of the questions I had, uh, so thank you, Councillor Luloff, and um, appreciate the question from Councillor Egli as well around our, our parks. So uh, nothing more for me. Thanks very much to, to staff. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Conseil Fleury, s'il vous plaît. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to, to point out uh, that uh, Mr. Kenlux's presentation and Ms. Etch's presentation were both very useful. Ms. Etch's, uh, uh, Mr. Kenlux. Uh, Next, we um, obviously our business community is excited, is also learning at the same time we are of the uh, phase two reopening, and have very specific questions. And I, I, I'm. Um, I'm unclear as to uh, at what which elements are city decisions versus when should we send them to the province, and if we send them to the province, where are we sending them? Uh, so it's it's Vera here. Um, to to begin with, uh, most of the decisions are provincial at this point because most things are closed under a provincial order, um, and so. Uh, the provincial order, you know, questions about that or comments, I, I guess, could be directed to the premier. Um, but I, I, I can't think of any. I, I personally, as a medical officer, Pell, have not closed down anything uh, in the in the city. So, I'm not sure, um, Mr. Kanellakis, okay. if you want want to add anything. Uh, no, Mr. Mayor. Would it be possible to share with members of council as? Businesses are getting um, w want have key questions ahead of Friday. If if we can send them to an appropriate contact provincially uh, for their c questions and concern, because the toolkit is great. It's a good uh, good per segment, but there are additional elements that need to be answered by the province, and it's often unclear who would respond. Yeah, I think the best uh, route, uh, Councillor, I refer a lot of people to Ontario.ca. Uh, they post uh, the regulations and so on. Uh, after their announcement, it's usually a day or two afterwards that answers questions. You know, do you have to wear a mask to go to a barber shop, and what's required uh, for for a patio, uh, and so on. So, I would suggest the best uh, site is, is Ontario.ca because these are all provincial regulations that have been approved by cabinet. Okay, and then uh, maybe uh, inter not relating to this because this is more resident side, but. As we are announcing our summer camps, child care, and pools, uh, we're getting questions uh, from condo boards. And I, I wonder, um, again, maybe where to direct them or uh, under what, are they, is this still a provincial uh, order for them to remain closed or, or uh, is this a city, uh, city direction going forward? You're talking about pools? Pools in condos or in non-city right. um, Dr. Etches, do you know anything about that? Um, I, I'm not sure. I probably, if there's a specific situation, I could um, look into it with my team. There are um, pools in in private condominiums, for example, that may still be closed uh, because they're trying to do the right thing, which is maintain physical distancing uh, between people, and so that. That is actually a, a, you know, building by building decision. Uh, it's one one I support. Uh, my my advice is to still um, have everyone maintain a two meters distance between people outside of their household, uh, and so um, that that may be 
why uh, people are, are continuing to have, have those facilities closed. Okay, okay. I'll follow up with you uh, via email. My last question is, Mr. Shenny, could you confirm, I know your team's looking into uh, the park programming and the pools. Can you, uh, Mr. K in his presentation was talking about uh, different regional factors. Can you maybe give us some insight as to how your thoughts of uh, making sure that uh, <clears throat> there's, there's different accesses wherever you live in the city to pools and summer camps? Uh, Mr. Mayor, the, the camps that we released uh, earlier this week were very much planned on, on a area by area for the city. Uh, unlike previous years, not every or not most facilities will have camps, but we did make sure based on our our known uh, registration patterns that uh, that the areas of the city that, that require the most service are getting them. Uh, with respect to what's to come next, the, the, the next opening of facilities, that's the work that we're doing right now in terms of uh, looking at opening up uh, pools and arenas and then other like facilities to to take a geographic approach um, even though uh, the general public is anxious to get back in many cases the the um, the, the volume users are, are th of these facilities uh, are still uh, leagues and and teams and they are very much dependent on the governing bodies uh, that regulate them and so that will modulate a little bit the demand for these facilities and we don't believe that they all need to open at the same time in some cases uh, because there simply won't be the, the, the full demand for all the pools and all the arenas at the same time. So we are taking a geographic approach uh, based on the demand that we see out there from, from the, the user groups that we're aware of. Okay, thank you. Merci, uh, Conseiller. Councillor El Chantiri, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and let uh, me echo my colleague on that. Thanks to our staff. Uh, one question, uh, and I think uh, more or less for uh, the Dr. Aches, is about the uh, the second phase of opening. And we're hearing a lot of uh, questions from uh, the small businesses by opening. Are, uh, are you know, uh, are they allowed to open washroom? Is that required? Because they are serving food, washroom should be open. Is there, and I know there's uh, some guideline that was used uh, for those outdoor uh, toilet. You know how often they have to be clean. So can we have uh, Dr. Aches, give us a list of requirements from the public health point of view so we can share them with the, our task force uh, this afternoon uh, or we can basically guide them to the Ottawa Public Health website to, to view those information. Because so many questions really with more detail. Can you help us there? Sure. I, I think the, the City of Ottawa um business toolkit does contain um, the, the basic guidance around washrooms being open and the frequency of cleaning. Um, we are recommending that washrooms be cleaned twice a day uh, or more based on how, how often they're being used. Um, we we don't, don't have any um, more specific uh, guidance, I don't believe, on washrooms, but the, they, are, they are to open uh, for people's use say in a restaurant, um, if they're using that outdoor part of the restaurant, people are allowed to go inside uh, to use the washroom. Uh, so that is part, part of um, what the business needs to consider then in terms of how to uh, make that as uh, safe as possible with uh, maintaining distance between uh, clients and, and washing the washroom. The other question, and I apologize for it, it's a little bit more detailed. You know, I know the inside the restaurant are closed, but if people outside and happen to have a thunderstorm or something, and uh, where would they, like, I mean, they ask those questions because really there's no detail from the province about them, and they left it up to the local health care to make those uh, decisions. Yes, that these these will be challenging situations for sure for businesses. The um, the principle remains that uh, the outdoors is safer than the indoors uh, when it comes to transmission of the virus, and keeping two meters apart. Uh, so if if people were to for some reason um, 
you know, access a washroom, need to get out of a thunderstorm, need, need to access first aid, um, you know, then, then the, the things that continue to provide protection are staying two meters apart. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you. That, that help. But, Mr. Mayor, I have one question for the, for the clerk. And uh, to, or to uh, I'm, I'm not sure the clerk or legal is going to answer this. So we heard uh, the election office will be opening on June 30. What, that, what does that mean for Cumberland by election? Is there a thought to start working on this process? Or, or what does it mean, the opening of the, uh, uh, of the office, election office? Mr. Clerk. Mr. Mayor, it's Rick O'Connor. Uh, what we are looking to do is open up the election office in anticipation of bringing our report with regards to Ward 19. A decision council has to make as to whether or not it will be an appointment process or whether or not it will be a uh, by-election. So you will send note to council on uh, after June 30 on a process, or what, what is the what's no. no, sorry, Mr. Mayor, we will be bringing a report to council with regards to the by-election or the appointment process. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Thank, thanks, Councillor Alshantiri. Councillor Tierney, please. Mute button. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'll keep it uh, very brief. Um, first of all, a great presentation. Uh, I just want to get to what I think is going to be the, the big question parents have related to splash pads. And forgive me, I might have missed it during birds chirping and bark stalking and all that stuff. Uh, it talked about uh, mid-June, following the release of the provincial uh, safety requirements. Real briefly, how soon do you think we're going to get those? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's Dan Chenier. Uh, generally, those uh, the regulations that go along with the announcements come out within a day or so. Uh, I checked this morning. They're not out yet. But what we're looking for is requirements for spinage or uh, any other requirement that might be attached to reopening. Uh, assuming those will be minimal, uh, then it's just a couple of days to uh, for city staff to go and essentially turn on the switch at every splash pad so that they're operational. Uh, and so that should not be a long process. Thank you so much, Dan. And my last question, very briefly, I, I, I've sent this in to Ottawa Public Health, and I feel sorry because then they got to go check with bylaw. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions around garage sales. Uh, do we know anything? Are we even allowed to have garage sales during this pandemic? I don't, I don't know how that works. Uh, my understanding is they were touched upon with the provincial order, uh, so garage sales were not permitted under the provincial order, uh, and I haven't seen that change uh, in this opening of stage two, so I'd expect that will continue to be um, not, not allowed at this point until there's a further uh, relaxation of the restrictions. By the province. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for the hard work. That's all I have today, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. Councillor Brockington, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dr. Etches, I just want to talk about the threat of a systematic transmission. You uh, provided an estimate up to two months ago that said up to 45,000 people in our city had asystematic symptoms. What, what are your thoughts right now on that number? Our, our numbers are very good. You admitted this morning everything is trending well. The number of active cases are quite low, comparatively speaking. Talk to me about the risk of asystematic transmission now compared to what your thoughts were a few months ago. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I, I, I just um, I think there's been a little misunderstanding in terms of uh, I, I would not have said that 45,000 people had asymptomatic uh, infection, but it, I, I believe at that time I would have given a range of the proportion of our population that may have been infected. Uh, with COVID and not had a confirmation of that. So people that weren't able to be tested because our testing capacity was limited to healthcare workers and people in hospital. Um, so uh, the estimates of the proportion of the population that have been infected, um, you know, right now, the best estimates we have are about 1%, maybe 2%. So 100,000, 200,000, like very, very max. There's always a range and, and, and the, that um, is going to be answered more definitively when we're able to do testing for antibodies. So yep. we'll be able to do that. So when it comes to the question of asymptomatic spread, uh, what we know is that it, it is happening, it does happen. Um, 
when people don't have symptoms, they can still be infectious. Uh, most uh, people do seem to go on to develop symptoms. So it's almost like people are pre-symptomatic uh, and then they develop a symptom. And so most spreading, um, you, you know, people will feel sick, they'll have a cough, they'll sneeze, there's, there's a, or, you know, have a sore throat, um, fever. People are, are going to be more infectious when they have symptoms. So, so you're projecting more virus out. But we do do the follow-up for the two days before people develop symptoms because there's evidence that even before people realize they're sick, they can be passing on the virus. And that's why we recommend masks. That's why we recommend physical distancing. Um, the, 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 um, the proportion, you know, the, the, we don't have definitive answers on this. Like, uh, the science continues to evolve, but we know it's a factor. And it's a factor that we need to keep in mind um, and, and why we have uh, these other recommendations to uh, recognize that we can't always tell when somebody is infected or infectious. Um, the other thing I'd like to highlight is the symptoms can be very mild. So when, when we did testing, for instance, in a long-term care home, and we tried to find any staff who didn't have symptoms but were infected or residents, Again, we found most people had some symptom, but maybe hadn't really thought it was COVID. You know, if, if they had a headache or were feeling nauseous, there can be atypical symptoms. And so, again, the message is you could be infected with COVID-19. Please get tested if you have symptoms. We're at a point in time where we want to find all the cases we can to follow up with contacts and break chains of transmission. So even those mild symptoms, we are recommending people present for testing. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the theory about children being high spreaders of the virus, has that theory been refined? I, I still have the same information that they're likely to be infected at about the same rates as their parents. Um, and the, the challenge with uh, young children, again, is they don't always show the same symptoms. It might not be apparent. Um, and so that could lead to more transmission. Um, we also know that younger children are not as good at washing their hands and they tend to touch their face and touch other things more. And so those do, those behaviors do increase the risk of transmission. Okay, although the data is, is pretty good for children under 18. Uh, just to Mr. Uh, Chenier, the summer camp, first of all, very happy that we're offering summer camps. Um, the number of spaces being offered per location, my understanding is quite low. Can you address this, please? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the Councillor is right that uh, this year, in order for us to comply with the Ministry directives, um, we are required to keep the group small and to keep um, various cohorts of the camp separate from each other. This means that essentially um, at most sites, groups of uh, eight kids and two staff uh, need to be given a completely separate area uh, with their own bathrooms, their own entrance, and their own equipment. This has resulted in us being able to, at some sites, offer one such cohort, depending on the size of the building. At, a, at other sites, the larger buildings, we've been able to get away with a few more. Um, but it has curtailed uh, the number of people that we can put into one building compared to other years when those limitations were not in place. Mr. Chenier, can you clarify your presence in OCH communities has always been strong in the summer, Caldwell, uh, Deborah Dines, Banff, Ledbury. I don't see organized camps here. Can you just address this, please? Uh, Mr. Mayor, in, in the past and this year as well, uh, camps based on going online and registering and paying a fee uh, have not uh, been successful for a variety of reasons. Affordability um, and, and generally uh, the, the the requirement for a different structure for camps. And so uh, in those communities, and I believe there are eight sites, we offer an alternative uh, which is free of charge and which is um, 
really catered to, to, to appeal to the local residents uh, on, a, on a more casual basis. And so you won't see those as part of our registration package. Uh, they will be organized locally in those communities. And uh, generally the staff are aware of the kids that have participated in those and will be reaching out to families uh, on a local basis to, to um, make them aware of the program. Okay, I'll, I'll just follow up offline with you because I, I'd like some more information. And my last question is just on the beaches, you and I have traded some email and today I'm seeing a different date of opening of, of, of up to July 6th. Um, given that Canada Day, there's not much planned, families are going to be in town, it could be hot, they're going to come to the beach. What is the likelihood we can have lifeguards at Westboro, Petrie and Mooney's be, you know, on or before July 1st? Uh, Mr. Mayor, the, the likelihood is good. We uh, we have traditionally aimed for the third Saturday in June to open beaches. We think that this year we probably will be able to do it by the fourth Saturday so that we will be ahead of uh, the Canada Day holiday. Well, doing it again. Um, See the screen? Maybe take a picture of it? Sorry, uh, Councillor Hubley, you're on. Uh, you're going to put yourself back on mute. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and so... Uh, all that to say is that, that yes, we think we, we will be ahead of Canada Day in terms of staffing the beaches. Okay, thank you. I, I think you understand how important this is and some of the vulnerable groups that use our beaches, lifeguards would be uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Agreed. Yes, thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Aguilai, please. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I just have one question uh, for uh, Mr. Kanellakis. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation and, and your efforts. Um, you had indicated uh, in the presentation that you saw city staff potentially going back to work on or about Labor Day and coming back into buildings like Constellation. Um, and uh, my question is, how does that reflect on when our libraries might open? I know we're having curbside service here but it, uh, currently, but I didn't see in the plan um, when the libraries might be might be open to the public again. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm not. That's a question. I don't know if Danielle McDonald is on the uh, is on the phone uh, or the chair of the library board can answer that. But my understanding is they haven't authorized um, them to uh, open yet. In terms, of, I'll just answer to be clear in our facilities. Uh, it'll be a limited number of staff that can come back after Labor Day. We're just trying to figure out how to configure our facilities, uh, configure our facilities to uh, to um, uh, ensure that we have proper social distancing and safety in the building. So that's the work that's happening over the next couple of months. Then we will allow uh, a certain number of staff back in, uh, either because they need flexibility, they need to come back in or they need to do their job, but it will not be the full complement of city staff returning to the administrative building. So the library question I can't answer other than I know that they were, they have not been given an order to open and they've gone to curbside pickup uh, for people to gather in their facilities, but I'm not sure if the chair or Danielle's on the phone. Um, Mr. Mayor, okay. if I might. Sure, yeah, if you don't mind, Matt. Yeah, no, not a problem at all. Um, listen, we're, we're bringing uh, back uh, more details uh, before July. Uh, staff is working really hard uh, to keep up uh, with um, the provincial orders. We do uh, want to ensure that we're providing more services uh, to our clients, uh, and we're just trying to figure out the best way to do that while protecting both the clients and our staff. So currently we have uh, six branches open and, and accepting returns and the holds that have already been placed. We're working now on uh, getting uh, new holds uh, and figuring out how we're going to get new holds out uh, and those processes. It's a very arduous process and we want to make sure that uh, we're able to offer services uh, across the city. So we're looking at uh, innovative things uh, like Wi-Fi hotspots and that sort of thing. So we'll have more to say uh, as the... Uh, ad hoc committee with uh, Councillor Brockington and, and Vice Chair Fisher uh, works through this. Uh, I sit on that as an ex officio and in and, and, and constant contact with uh, um, with uh, Danielle McDonald. New holds is next, uh, and then more branches. Uh, but we'll have more to say that uh, before uh, July. 
Yes, Thank so you. It's, Vera, it's Vera here just to uh, to clarify that the stage two does enable libraries to open, but only under certain, uh, you know, for certain aspects of their service. So it's not allowed for individuals to handle items on the library shelves, for instance. So it's, um, it's a different kind of reopening that's allowed. It's going to be a little bit of time before we, have, we see browsing again in that afternoon. So, Councilor Eglai, anything else? No, thank you for that. I mean, and, and I welcome the information about the uh, Wi-Fi um, hotspots because that's a question that's come up several times uh, for families that, that either don't have access to or can't afford Wi-Fi. Um, the library's been a real haven for them uh, for doing homework, job searches, all those sorts of things. So uh, if we can get that out the door uh, sooner rather than later, I think that a lot of communities really would really appreciate that. Right. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Councillor Moffat. Thank you. Um, no questions. Just to build on, though, something that Councillor Elshantiri was discussing, just for reference for staff in their deliberations on running a by-election as opposed to appointing. Um, there were some successful elections just run recently this week. There was an Ottawa connection with one of them. Uh, former Ottawa Senator Brandon Bachensky was elected the mayor of Grand Forks, North Dakota, and they actually ran mail-in ballot with a higher voter turnout than they had four years prior. So something of consideration for staff. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Leeper, please. Thanks, uh, Mayor. I think there is a popular expectation or an anecdotal expectation that there might be some kind of a second wave of the uh, COVID-19 in the fall. What, uh, what does a pivot look like for the city in terms of re-implementing restrictions? Uh, how well are we set up for that? And, and who's going to make those decisions? Are, are we going to be driven largely by provincial decisions on that front? And, and Dr. Etches, uh, could I get your thinking as well about uh, the likelihood or not that we will see a, an increase in cases in the fall? Sure. Uh, uh, let so me may, start. may I suggest that Dr. Etches goes first so that I can follow? Yes. Yes. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kanalakis. So the presentation uh, I, I gave today has slide five with the modeling that shows the hospitalizations and how they can go up. Uh, if our physical distancing measures are relaxed too much. And that could start in July, the increase, um, you know, with, with unmanageable levels even being reached in August. Um, so it's a real possibility uh, because most of us are not immune um, and, and that contact between each other, you know, increases the risk of transmission. So it's something that uh, Ottawa Public Health is responsible to monitor. We are monitoring on a daily basis and then communicating out so that if we start to see things trending in the wrong direction, people can act quickly with the most important thing being the actions of all the people in Ottawa to maintain two meters distance between people outside of their household. Um, and you know, right now we're learning about how we can go back to work and back to activities with that physical distancing in place. And so, uh, you know, I'm thinking that would be the first advice back to the population is to do their part. Um, I will, will, will make that clear that that's my advice uh, as soon as it's needed um, based on the data. Uh, the province is also looking at data across the province and, and will, um, you know, potentially take other actions that affect the whole province and will follow, follow the, the provincial direction as well. Um, but I think that uh, businesses have told us loud and clear it's very harmful to start up and then have to close again. And so this is what we are all trying to avoid, uh, is to, to proceed in a way that's cautious and safer and keeps the infections at the manageable level. Mr. Mayor, I would say for the uh, city services, after we've been through what we were through in March, where we had to literally turn everything around in two weeks, um, we've got pretty good at it. And um, 
we will be in, uh, obviously, uh, Dr. Etches is part of our emergency operations control group and is advising the senior leadership team. If the data changes and there is a second wave, the city, because most of our services continue going, which is in a very different way, we can revert back to any kinds of closures or any kinds of enhanced social distancing uh, very quickly now uh, because we have the playbook for that. So we're not concerned about that. We're monitoring that. Uh, we're working with public health. We still are in our emergency mode. Our emergency operations uh, center is up and running. We are we are uh, uh, surveying uh, all the information, and we get updated uh, daily in terms of what they do. So we can turn on a dime in terms of um, in terms of shifting gears. I'm hoping that doesn't happen, and we're, that's why we're also progressing in a in a in a cautious way, in a measured way, in terms of how we let people back even into our buildings, because it's harder once we let everybody back in. I mean, we don't want to, and that's not the guidance right now, but we will maintain the posture we have when we have limited uh, physical um, um, uh, presence of staff in administrative buildings, and the rest of our services were running during the pandemic anyways, the ones that had to be out in the field. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right. Council Leeper, anything uh, else? Thank you very much. Uh, no, thank you very much to both. Right. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Meehan, please. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, yes, thank you to everyone for all the hard work uh, and for the extensive uh, reports. I appreciate them. Just a couple of quick questions. Now that the parks are reopening, um, what are we going to do about bylaw and the park ambassadors? Do they continue to work or um, are they, uh, is their job now done? Mr. Mayor, it's Dan Chenier. The park ambassadors continue to work. Um, they continue to uh, visit so approximately 30 to 40 parks a day uh, and continue with distancing advice and answering questions and uh, because the play structures are still off limits continue to remind people that they are not open at this time. Thank you. And Mr. Um, Mayor, sorry, sorry, Tony yeah. DeMonte, bylaw will also continue their work. And do we know how long that will continue uh, through the summer, even after the play structures are open? Uh, Mr. Mayor, with the park ambassadors, we haven't set uh, an, an end time for them. At this point, uh, we still have the capacity to support because we're not full, uh, fully uh, up and programming. Uh, and there appears to con still be a, a requirement in the parks uh, for the service, and so uh, certainly into July. And is bylaw still going to be ticketing? Um, Mayor, our... Um our objective has been and continues to be uh, information and uh, getting people to understand the importance of Dr. Etch has indicated to continue to, to social distance. And yes, we still have a tool to ticket uh, on, on occasion, but that's uh, quite few and far between. But we'll continue monitoring. Uh, when the, uh, when the uh, provincial restrictions are lifted, obviously those, those elements then are, are allowed to be used, so then it's, not, it's no longer a problem. Okay, thank you so much for that. And I think I missed uh, Dan, Dan Shen, yeah, this brief question may be for you. When we talked about rehiring, um, where are we rehiring our summer students? Uh, and I apologize if I, apologize if I missed the response to that. Our summer crews are responsible for, for cutting uh, city property and, and parks and things like that. Are we gonna be bringing them on this summer? Uh, Mayor, uh, I'll let Mr. Wiley speak to the grass cutting crews in terms of the lifeguards and summer camp staff. Uh, we are in the process of bringing them back on. As, uh, as Council will know, we suspended uh, making hiring decisions on our summer student program uh, until we were uh, clear on the level of programming that we'd be offering. Uh, we have approximately 4,000 unionized staff that were put on declared emergency leave. Uh, we will be looking at them as a source of, of some of our staffing, as well as uh, back in February, we did a summer recruitment campaign. So we have a good inventory of candidates to look at uh, for our summer jobs. Yeah, excuse me, Mr. Mayor, it's Kevin Wiley. For the grass cutting crews, uh, we are only hiring back summer students when absolutely necessary. We're looking at redeployment of some staff from other areas, and uh, and keeping our collection crew, or sorry, our cutting crews on the parks. So it's part of our ongoing cost containment strategies in the wake of COVID. 
So we may be hiring some back in limited in limited numbers. Can I suggest that that would be a great idea? Uh, the park where um, I spend most of my time, if there's, um, there's actually a difficulty in walking on the paths because of physical distancing restrictions. And the, the long grass on the sides of the pathway are now uh, prohibiting people from getting off the pathway because they are concerned about ticks. So, and I've been told that staffing issues are, are, are preventing us from getting in there now. So if, that, if that's at all possible to get some more crews in, uh, that I would, I would really, really welcome that. So um, also uh, clarity on uh, our limited uh, summer camp program begins July the 15th, but there was really no start date uh, for the recreation centers where many of these uh, summer camps will be located. Um, I am assuming that there, there, there will be some coordination between that. Uh, like, will my, my Riverside South uh, Community Centre be open before the summer camp starts? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, no, not at this time. Uh, there are two things at play here. One is the announcement this week from the Premier that community centres could reopen, but for non-recreation programs only summer camps being the exception that, that was approved uh, a day later. Um, so at this point, there is uh, limited programming uh, that can be put in community centres from a recreation perspective. We will open the buildings for summer camps, but provincial orders on, uh, on resuming summer camps uh, requires that there be very little, if anything else, in the building so that the space not be shared with other groups, with rental groups, or with other programs. And so at least initially, from early July, the primary reason for opening those buildings will be to accommodate summer camps. So they will be opening for the summer camps. Other services are still on hold. Okay. Um, yes. Anything else, Councillor? I think that, that does it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councillor Cavanaugh, please. Councillor Cavanaugh, mute button. Oh, okay. Uh, Councillor Shirelli? No, it's okay. I'll pass. Councillor McKinney? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's uh, also a question to uh, Mr. Chenier. I think everybody's pretty excited about recreation services and uh, people being able to get back to with their, their themselves and their families to uh, to some sort of recreation programming. Um, just a, Dan, I wondered what the rationale was for. Um, I noticed in the the day camps for kids that uh, there isn't one in the downtown that will be available for uh, for kids either at Jack Purcell or Plant. Um, so I just wonder what the rationale was for that and then just a follow-up to that question uh, maybe at the same time is um, because we know that we have a couple of recreation associations, one Plant Pool Rec Association and um, uh, Jack Purcell Rec, Rec Association uh, who do offer um, drop-in um, camps outdoors uh, to, to kids. And will that be something that's considered for uh, the kids in, uh, who are living uh, downtown? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the, the councillor is right that not every site that has traditionally had camps uh, will happen uh, this year. Staff based the decision on the ability of the buildings to, uh, to, to provide enough separation and access to washrooms and outdoor play space as best as possible. Um, but we are also aware that some of our partners that use city buildings uh, are intent on offering camps. Uh, this week, we, our staff are reaching out to those groups uh, to talk to them about the requirements, the, the provincial requirements uh, and guidelines in terms of operating camps uh, so that we can work with them uh, in a supportive way as much as possible uh, to make it possible for them to offer their services. And so uh, we're making those connections this week okay well that that uh, certainly would be helpful in terms of providing some uh, access to um, kids downtown like in Jack Purcell or, or plant it really um, it's unfortunate not to have uh, either of those 
Uh, my my last question again to to Dan. I know in the um, uh, Mr. Panalakis' uh, presentation, he did talk about, you know, with the recovery phase uh, first uh, for the restart in July, talking about indoor pools. Um, this is still under review by by the province. Is that correct? Or is there some, um, is it, do you have any indication of what a timeline would look like or what a process would look like for uh, opening indoor pools, and I guess then at that time, what does that look like in terms of opening up a uh, recreation center? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, pools have been uh, okay to open by the province. That was an announcement made this week. What they haven't provided us yet are the detailed regulations that will govern that opening, so it will not be uh, reopening in the way that we operated before. We believe there will be um, new restrictions in terms of limiting the number of people that can use the pool at any given time and possibly access or, or lack of access to other amenities like hot tubs and saunas and those kinds of things. We're awaiting that. We expect that that will be uh, on their website uh, hopefully within a day or so. And then based on that, uh, we will formulate a plan in terms of, uh, as I talked about earlier, uh, starting to roll out reopening on a, on a geographic basis so that pools in every area of the city can, uh, can start to open. Uh, at this point, be, because we have not had staff uh, on the pool deck since March, uh, it will also require uh, bringing people back from, uh, from their emergency leave and uh, reorienting them to the new processes and the, the new requirements of, uh, of the provincial regulations. So we're probably looking in, into July before uh, people are actually in the water. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's uh, the only question I have. Thanks, Mr. Councilor Mayor? McKinney. Councilor Kavanaugh, we missed yes, you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. The mute button wouldn't turn off. Thank you. Um, uh, for, um, for the city, um, for, uh, for Mr. Kanellakis and his crew, um, in terms of the um, online registration, I share the concerns of, uh, of uh, Councilor Brockington of, about accessibility. Um, and um, uh, for those uh, for our for those who uh, who do not have access to computers, um, how is that being dealt with in uh, low income communities that uh, would need uh, would need these camps? Uh, Mr. Mayor, because all of our facilities are closed and have been closed, we don't have the ability to offer. Uh, counter service at this time and so uh, the councillor is right uh, that um, the registrations are online only uh, we uh, in the uh, some communities targeted communities where we generally don't charge for camps or require a registration and the, there, there are uh, I think eight communities that will have these programs there is no registration and staff will be in the facility in the neighborhood uh, making a direct contact with families that have participated in these programs before and some of the other community agencies that they are aware of but unfortunately this for this registration we just do not have the ability to provide uh, an, an in-person registration alternative for for these folks. Yes, now I, I realize that the the challenges, and uh, this is very unfortunate. What about children with accessibility issues um, who might need extra help? Um, will they be provided for? Uh, yes, there is online a uh, also posted at the same time as our camp. There is an inclusive recreation guide there, and it identifies, I believe, eight facilities, two in each of the de geographic areas, where we will offer what's known as shared care, which is uh, an additional service that provides uh, staff support for children that have uh, a specific requirement that, that can be with them to help them participate in the program. And uh, that information is in a separate guide, but it posted in the same area as our summer camp information. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one of the challenges that we'll have in Bay Ward is Britannia Beach because it's going to be closed for dredging. And, um, well, I don't know what the forecast is, but I imagine it's going to be a hot one this summer. 
Um, and I understand that you're going to have um, from your staff that you're going to have uh, patrols of, of lifeguard trained people in the area because the surfer beach is still there and um, it's a very small beach and I know that swimming won't be encouraged but um, I just want to know how we're going to handle um, a large influx of people because it's really hard to turn people away on a hot day um, from that little bitty uh, piece of uh, entry into the water. Um, Ms. Rare, firstly, the, the, the beach area itself will be cordoned off because it will be a construction zone, so it will prob properly be fenced off uh, in, in, in the coming days or weeks um, before work starts. Uh, in terms of the rest of the park and access to the waterfront, um, Councillor, you're right, we will do our best to provide both the park ambassadors and, and on-site staff to remind people, uh, uh, but it's not unusual for people to swim off of those areas and all along the river for that matter. Uh, we'll do our best, but uh, there's a lot of shoreline to cover and uh, uh, obviously we, we those that uh, want, to, want access to the water, uh, we have no real way of preventing them in any case. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll need to keep an eye on it because uh, we are concerned about that in the community. Um, in terms of going forward, um, one of the things we've learned is how um, how much um, you've managed to do in terms of having staff work from home. It's been incredible, and including us, the counselors and our staff. Um, and you have to wonder about, um, is this put a different perspective on how we look at um, space that we allocate for, for the city? Um, are we looking at that in the future in terms of maybe we don't need as much if we can have more options to work at home and I realize not everybody can and it will certainly help when ch child care opens up again in schools so those kids aren't running around in the house as well but um, is that been thought of? Uh, Mr. Mayor um, yes in fact um, you know it's a little premature to to um, come to a, a conclusion about our space needs as a city and because um, just the nature of the buildings where our administration is but it is on the uh, the list of items that uh, the senior leadership team is looking at as we move through the summer, um, trying to assess what the forward outlook is and then what space requirements will the city need going into the future, and can we accommodate uh, working from home for a large part of our uh, workforce. The federal government certainly is looking at that. I've spoken to their uh, deputy minister, and uh, this is something that I think a lot of organizations are looking at. And uh, But I think it's a little early to come to a conclusion, but the work is going to start over this summer and into the fall to uh, make a determination um, on what our needs are because once we figure out what, how, where we stabilize, where is that new equilibrium for how many people have to come into the building, how many people can work from home, in what areas, what specific services. It's, it's complex, as I know uh, all the council appreciates because we have so many different mm -hmm. service requirements, but um, it is definitely uh, something we need to look at, and I thank you, council, for raising that. Uh, no problem, and I expect we'll have to stay in close contact with our federal counterparts uh, as well since they um, make up a majority of the workforce and impact uh, roads Any and transit. So, so that would be important. Anything uh, else, Councillor? Yes, I do. Uh, for uh, Dr. Etches, I want to thank her for all her work. Um, this has been a marathon, an ultra marathon, I would put it. Um, and uh, I want to thank her for everything she's doing. One of the hardest hit um, areas has been um, long-term care facilities, and it's been just devastating. And uh, we've heard from the province that they're looking at having a commission on this, and we have some just um, terrible situations, terrible conditions um, in some of our homes with um, absolutely appalling numbers of, uh, of the number of cases and deaths. And I'm wondering if uh, Ottawa Public Health will be taking an active role um, in uh, making recommendations to the Commission on um, what's happened here in Ottawa. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we are, um, you know, actively involved in, in work with our partners, with long-term care home operators, our hospital partners who've been in supporting, um, and the and the regulators of the homes. 
um, you know, now, now that we're seeing the homes um, get out of outbreak situations and uh, the need for hospital uh, support is, you know, is really decreasing, um, it, it may be that there's a, a bit of time to reflect on the lessons learned. Um, we will be providing uh, our observations uh, certainly uh, into any process related to how we can, you know, improve um, control of infections uh, in long-term care homes and prevent ideally prevent outbreaks as well. Um, yes, we, we will, uh, you know, our focus uh, at the t for the time being has been to really make sure that uh, the immediate needs uh, and steps were taken to, to protect uh, lives and, uh, you know, control the outbreaks. I, I thank you very much. Um, in my own area, Carling View Manor, it, um, I'm hearing from families of, who have uh, someone in there and, um, it, it seems that it, this has been going on for a long time. This is before the outbreak that there have been compromises. And I think we need to look really deep at, at, at how they're operated overall. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And, and of course, our city partners, um, you know, under Donna Gray have a lot of experience uh, and more insights into how long-term care homes uh, are, are operating and run. So we'll, we'll be working closely uh, also um, you know, with, with, with her group um, on any any reflections. Um, Mayor, if, if you don't mind, I just, I want to um, indicate that I, I believe uh, my team has pointed out that my math was wrong uh, earlier. So when I was replying to Councillor uh, Brockington a little bit about how we estimate the actual number of infections that have been out there, um, I didn't calculate my percentages correctly on our million population. Um, so if you don't mind for the record, I'll just correct that. Um, that that sure. right now, uh, right now we have uh, 2,000, uh, you know, just over 2,000 laboratory confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Ottawa. And we estimate that the actual number out there uh, is, is between five times that or 30 times that. So, you know, a range of between 10,000 and 60,000 cases. So um, that that's in the percentage range of about 1% to uh, 6%, you know, based on um, different studies and estimates around the world of how the laboratory confirmed cases reflect the actual cases in the population. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So thank you, uh, our colleagues uh, from uh, Public Health in the city uh, for that very thorough report. We're on to committee reports from FEDCO, Finance and Economic Development Committee, Rapol in the middle, Catals, Motion Appointment, Councillor Liaison for Anti-Racism and Ethnocultural Relations Initiatives. Councillor King, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I would like to thank the Finance and Economic Development Committee for their support for the creation of the position of Council Liaison for Anti-Racism and Ethnocultural Relations Initiatives. I'm gratified that Council is responding to requests by Indigenous, Black, racialized, and religious communities throughout Ottawa to take action concerning equity of opportunity and outcome in our city and to work towards the elimination of systemic racism in our municipal government. In the role of liaison, I'll be working with Ottawa's diverse communities, the mayor, along with city staff, to ensure the effective rollout of the anti-racism secretariat, which this council approved last winter in the 2020 budget. The new policy office will target systemic racism by adopting an anti-racism approach and lens concerning the way our city government develops policies, makes decisions, evaluates programs, and monitors outcomes. It will enhance community partnerships to work towards the more equitable outcomes or for more equitable outcomes for all people in our city. I'm extremely pleased that we will begin this work by launching a much needed conversation through public consultation about the challenges confronting many in our city. Community members are excited about the prospect of being meaningfully heard on a multitude of issues which include employment, health outcomes and support for small business. Many people in our city are also excited about the prospect of the Secretariat engaging in public education on issues of racism in the city. Most importantly, community members are excited at the prospect of real policy changes in areas of economic development, mental health, and youth engagement. I want to thank the Mayor and Council for its foresight in acknowledging the challenges that Black, Indigenous, people of colour, newcomers and religious minorities experience on a daily basis in the city 
and recognizing these challenges in our city long before the tragic events and protests which swept up the United States just recently. I believe that Council's broad commitment to equality recognizes that when we work together towards improving the prospects of all of our residents, we can currently improve the prospects for our entire city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, and thank you for accepting the, uh, the responsibilities. Does anyone else wish to speak to the item? So on the motion, carried. Carried. Hey. Any dissents? Very good pleasure. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, transportation community report number nine, uh, Ottawa electric kick scooter uh, strategy and pilot project. Um, I think some, someone asked, uh, they had a question, I believe, on this item. Or was it Councillor Tierney? Do. Did you want to speak to it as the chair? I do. I, I think a couple of us did. Count, Councillor Meehan, I hear you. Go ahead. Oh. Brock, Okay. I would just like to hear what staff uh, are telling people with uh, vision problems and people with disabilities about uh, the, the hazards that the scooters could present. And I know that there is quite a concern within the community um, that the, the scooters are quite silent. And uh, there is a concern that it's going to be a, a real problem. So I'd just like to hear how staff is responding to that. Thank you. So who from staff will speak to this? Mr. Mayor, it's uh, VBT here. Perhaps I can take that. Okay. Okay. So um, we have met with our accessibility advisory uh, committee and have had a few meetings with them. The issues are about, um, well, uh, clutter because uh, of the, if they are parked, uh, misparked in the uh, sidewalk area. Um, so in the report, it addresses that. We have assigned um, a space for them to park, for the scooters to be parked in the uh, furniture zone. And later on, when we get da uh, more data, we will see where people are going. Perhaps we can assign some um, uh, spots on the street for an area for scooters to be parked at uh, that aren't necessarily uh, big enough for a car parking spot, things like that. Uh, they, there we will also expect um, the service uh, providers, the companies, to respond very quickly to any complaints about misplaced scooters. Um, they will have a period of time, and after that, if they're not uh, picked up, then, um, then our, uh, the, our team will come out and um, impound them and there will be a fee for the, for the companies to re retrieve their scooters. So that's the parking in the area of um, people walking. The other is um, the, all the equipment are required to have a bell. The province requires that as well so that they can be sounded as their uh, scooters or um, the users are passing by others on the, on the uh, multi-use pathways. Um, so it's the parking, it's that, um, it's the response time. So um, generally it is uh, in other municipalities, there's a basic, uh, uh, a standard two hour response time. We will work with the companies here in Ottawa to see if they can improve that response time and aim for something like around one hour instead of two hours. And, and then after that, if they don't do that, then the impound process would kick in and the, the staff will be deployed to address the issue uh, based on uh, uh, operational um, uh, practicality. Did I answer your question, uh, Councillor? Um, yes, thank you, Vivi. Uh, my concern centers around, uh, I know it's nice to have a bell. Bicycles are required to have bells, and um, my experience is that they have not been using them, especially where I bike and walk. Uh, uh, do we have the bylaw uh, in, team in place in order to um, monitor the use of these scooters uh, on our multi-use pathways and, and other places. Uh, I anticipate, just because they, they can get up to speed, that we're going to have a few problems. Uh, and do we have the, the, um, the bylaw there in order to enforce the, the rules and regulations? Mr. Mayor, it's uh, Tony DeMonte. So we've worked closely with our colleagues as they were developing this. Um, 
uh, bylaw will have some role, and, and VV just talked about, you know, improperly parked these scooters or any ADOA violations. However, any moving violations is the responsibility of the Ottawa Police Service. So, for instance, speed, sidewalks, bike lanes, those challenges. Uh, that's in enforced by Ottawa Police Services um, and on anywhere in the municipal jurisdiction. And they're, they're aware and they participated and their team is well aware of this, uh, uh, this evolving uh, file. That's my, that was my question. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Brockington, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just so I understand, we have a we have the authority from the provincial government, which is allowing a five-year pilot to take place. And in Ottawa, we're going to have basically a five-month test pilot. And staff have indicated in their report you're going to test a number or measure a number of stats or variables, and you're going to report back, I guess, through the transportation committee. At what point? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's Vivi again. Um, so uh, actually, because uh, typically a season would be from from May to October, but we'll we will have less of that for this first year, uh, and we would continue to have uh, if it's, it goes well and that there are few complaints and lots of compliance and there's um, there's a demand to keep this uh, the scooters as part of our mobility choice um, offerings, then then we will uh, have another year of renewal, and so there could be four more renewals of the uh, the pilot project until the end of the fifth year. Um, so we were uh, asked by the Accessibility Advisory Committee to report back within six months of the um, of this project, and so we will do that. It'll uh, go to them, and we would, of course, uh, be happy to send a report to Transportation Committee as, as well on the, the findings that we get. One of the requirements in this uh, program is that the um, providers are to um, give us data. So there's, there's data about usage, about um, origin and destination, a number of things that we've listed in our report, and we will report back on, on the use and where people are going, um, on compliance, and generally um, feedback from, from the public on these issues. Okay, so can, is it fair to say, though, that in, um, you know, the winter of 2021, there will be an information report coming to Transportation Committee on, on the uh, first few months of this pilot? We, this pilot will go to the end of uh, October, and then we will gather the information and work on a report, and we'll report back as soon as possible, and likely, yes, in early 2021. Okay. I just wanted to confirm you will come to the Transportation Committee. I would think so, because this is a new program, and uh, we'd like to report back on, on its uh, success or issues. I want to applaud you on page 16. You have, you have identified a number of variables you're going to measure and provide information on. I very much support that. And as you know, in speaking to you yesterday, um, your report talks about there are both pros and cons on the transit system for e-scooter use. The pros are when you get to the end of a, a transit line, you could have scooters there that, that you know, complement the journey a passenger's taking, taking to take them home or take them to work. I see benefits there. My concern is there could be people who would normally take transit who will now substitute that mode of travel to now take scootering. And so I wanted to know, is there an effective way to estimate, I do think you, have, you talk about estimates in your report, but after the first year of pilot, will you be able to provide a more accurate estimate on people who would normally take public transit, whether it's the downtown core or, or short visits between neighborhoods, who are now taking e-scooters? Um, Mr. Mayor, um, for this initial period and during this pandemic, the objective of uh, providing e-scooters is more to do with um, reducing the crowding on transit. So because um, there won't to be, you know, the, the travel patterns are very unusual during this period. Uh, 
it would be difficult for us to say definitively that so much was carved off of transit. What we do see is this is going to be helpful in terms of that um, physical distancing and for people have to have to commute. Post-pandemic, of course, our objective is to feed and support transit, as you have said and what we've noted in our report as well. So we will have to look at the data and see what we collect and, and analyze it, and then we'll report back on, those, on what we find. So just to be clear, because I don't want to be disappointed when you release your report to the committee, are you going to be able to at least consider my request and um, working with the companies, find out if you are able to estimate the impact on public transit. I hear what you're saying, Councillor, and we will do our best, but we have to see what data we have and what we're able to, to analyze. Um, because, uh, you know, our assessment is not just on the computer, uh, scooter, sorry, scooter use compliance, but uh, also its impact and effectiveness on mobility choices and on other modes. So we, we'll try to look into that. Of course, that's of, a, of an interest to us when we're looking at trends and looking at our overall transportation system. So um, I can't say exactly how, what we're going to get and what we will see, but of course that is one of the intentions. Thank you, Ms. Chi. I've, I've certainly seen scooters in use in, in many different cities I've been able to travel to. The number one issue that locals I've spoken to is how they are, uh, for all intents purposes, abandoned on sidewalks uh, and just left there when a person's done and the risks that are real for some pedestrians. Uh, you know, just think about night sidewalks that aren't illuminated in some cities. Um, so we need to be able to, if this, if this becomes a problem in Ottawa, to be able to address this and work with the companies right away to ensure they're just not literally left on the sidewalk, in the middle of a sidewalk or, or other places. So I, I really support this pilot. I hope it's successful and people um, uh, you know, use this mode of, of transportation, but we have to be aware of, I think, some real issues that may exist and we have to address right away. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you. Councillor uh, Aglai, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, I appreciate the staff has, has uh, listened to the AAC and, and they recently submitted a, a memo uh, for consideration today. So I'm, I'm glad to see that that's happened. Um, but some of the changes that, oh, or some of the things that were mentioned this morning, I don't recall necessarily being in place um, during the transportation meeting. And, and I don't sit on the committee, but I was trying to listen in as well as I could. So um, do the service providers uh, that are going to be furnishing the scooters to the city or in the city, are, are they on board with the, with the idea that they're going to be responsible for, for towing fees, in effect, if, if, if the city has to go and, and remove these? Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, yes, that is, uh, they, they are aware of that. Uh, so it's about the impounding and the cost uh, that the city incurs, and we would expect the companies to, um, to pay for those expenses uh, when they retrieve their scooters. But it is our intention, and we're working with the companies, that they deal with these issues before it be, uh, for, uh, um, rises to you know, the, the need to impound the scooters. And we want uh, prompt action, so that's what uh, we will be discussing with the um, the companies and I mean we've already started that discussion uh, and it'll be things will have to be included in the agreement or the contract that we have with them with them for this uh, season so so in, in principle though they have agreed to reimburse the city so so by law which is already stretched as, as they're dealing with 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 COVID aren't going to find themselves on the hook for additional costs for vehicles pick these up and, and space to, to store these and man, man or people power rather to, to pick them up. I believe that's correct, yes. Because we wouldn't want Andrew to do a pilot and then find out that it's actually going cost to us, cost us money to address, address the problem. Okay, so that, that, that's good to hear. Um, I, I have to say, again, I, I'm a fan of active transportation um, and uh, you know, an alternative to, to getting in your car or getting on transit. And I really do hope that this works. But, again, I have seen it in U.S. cities. 
where it's it's uh, virtually a wasteland of 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 scooters just dropped all over the place, and it's that's not safe. And and I I echo what Councillor Broxton has said, has said, and and I and I uh, applaud your approach, Ms. T, that you you want the companies to be responsible and to be out there and fixing the problem as it happens, because it can create a real barrier for for people who are mobility challenged. Uh, and so I'm hoping that that is built into the contract as we go forward and that if it's not happening, if the work is not being done by the company, that we have we have a way of removing ourselves from this pilot in a fairly uh, efficient manner. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councillor Luloff? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Really appreciated um, staff's uh, engagement on this file uh, up to and including uh, this morning. Glad to see that we'll be moving uh, towards uh, one hour um, after receiving a complaint. And glad to see that steep fines will be imposed, understanding that it's going to take some time uh, for provincial review, uh, given the current context with uh, COVID-19. Uh, but that uh, OPS and bylaw services may issue warnings and commence prosecutions by way of summons. Um, so that's great. Um, so I continue to engage with the Accessibility Advisory Committee and uh, this morning uh, was speaking with the chair uh, who has uh, two uh, further questions and one comment. Uh, we want to ensure that the city has the capacity to intervene at the one hour and one minute mark to impound a scooter creating an accessibility barrier. And we want to ensure that the city can be made aware of a company's failure to remove an improperly parked scooter within an hour. You can imagine how devastating it would be for somebody with vision impairment um, to come across one of these things uh, and land flat on their face on the pavement. We need to make sure that we're leaving uh, our sidewalks accessible. Um, and the chair would also recommend that the trans uh, at the Transportation Committee and did recommend to the Transportation Committee that the project should not continue beyond the pilot unless scooters can be modified to make a continuous audible noise to alert blind pedestrians as bells are not sufficient uh, as a permanent solution as has been suggested. So I don't know if staff want to uh, comment on those points. Um, sorry, um, Court Curry is also on the line. Perhaps you can speak to the, um, the first two issues. Um, the, the third issue about um, a continuous sound, um, we'll have to talk to the um, service providers, the companies that have these scooters, um, whether this is possible. But um, right now it's uh, the bells, and that's what uh, the province has uh, indicated as well. Court? Mayor, uh, we have sat down with uh, the companies that are interested in, in uh, providing the service in Ottawa this year and have gone over the way in which uh, it is going to work in terms of removal from the right-of-way. Uh, as Ms. Chi uh, advised, we will, as a first line of, uh, of uh, offence, uh, require the companies to uh, pick up their, their uh, scooters within one hour. They are averaging about 30 to 40 minutes uh, in other jurisdictions in Canada, um, and they will have uh, teams patrolling the right of way. Um, as, as Ms. D said, there will be the impounding fee with a with a, a city administrative fee attached to that. We're also taking a security of $25,000, and that security can be activated based on uh, on poor behavior if we see any poor behavior by the uh, the vendors. And finally, I would add that there is going to be a communications program. Uh, we are taking a special fee uh, per unit uh, that will go towards uh, our city communications uh, department in terms of putting out messaging to the public on how to park an e-scooter uh, and how not to park an e-scooter and the importance, of course, of uh, parking them properly to ensure that, that there is complete uh, accessibility on the, uh, on the clearway. Really, really appreciate your work on this, Mr. Curry. You're a consummate professional, and I know that the city will continue to do everything that we can uh, to ensure um, that our accessibility community is not uh, put at risk by a pilot like this, and really appreciate your collaboration. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, before we go to Councillor Tierney as the chair of the committee, does anyone else wish to speak to the item? Councillor Tierney? 
Great. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I, I, first of all, I want to thank the members of Transportation Committee. We actually had a very good dialogue and many of these same questions did come up. Uh, I also, and as well as the Mayor, both uh, had concerns because we've seen what's happened in American cities. And I think a lot of the answers that were provided by the two uh, scooter companies really put a lot of our minds at rest. And I think just real briefly, uh, the fact they have the geofencing, it's a very limited area where they can go. Uh, the fact that uh, what, some of the differences compared to the states, uh, they, they hold more money uh, every time you rent one of these things. And if you lose it, you're going to get hit in the pocketbook pretty hard for the cost of uh, one of these e-scooters. Uh, also, the, the, the laws, and I want to thank uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Luloff for those questions back and forth. Some of the fines, if you run into people, are pretty severe. So uh, on that note, uh, we, we had a great uh, conversation, a transportation, it passed unanimously. Uh, it's a small number, and uh, if there is issues, we always have the option of pulling their cards, and we have two partners that really, really want this to be successful. They truly believe it, and they want to see this as a good uh, item for our city. So on that, Mr. Mayor, uh, I look for uh, council support. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a, a couple of uh, observations. I think like many uh, people who have seen this operate in different cities, and particularly the United States, myself included, uh, I do have some concerns, uh, both from a point of view of ensuring the uh, visually impaired community are not going to be put at risk. Uh, it's not going to cost us a fortune running all over the place to pick up these uh, scooters. Uh, I've seen, I saw a couple of examples in, in one state uh, last year where the, uh, the parent uh, obviously used their credit card to um, you know, book or rent one of these scooters and you know, it looked like a 10-year-old swerving in and out of uh, parked cars, uh, just an accident waiting to happen. So I'm going to support uh, the report. It is a pilot. It'll be up to the companies to ensure that they live up to our high expectations. I thank Councillor Luloff for his liaison with the uh, Accessibility Advisory Committee and I thank those volunteer members for their input. And we want to make sure that this is used, this, this program turns out to be a positive from an alternative transportation mode perspective as opposed uh, to a real problem. So um, on the report, item seven, carried. 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 Any dissents? Yeah, dissent, uh, Scott Moffat. Dissent. Scott Moffat, okay. And a and who? Councillor Carol Meehan? Lamb. Carol uh, Meehan, okay. Item eight, uh, bike sharing and electric uh, kick scooter sharing agreements with service providers. Carried? Carried. Okay. Carried. Any, dis any Carried. dissents? Same dissents? Councillor Meehan and Moffat? Sorry, Councillor Meehan, uh, are you dissenting? Yeah. You're dissenting, yes, Councillor Moffat. No, I, I have no issue with, this, with the actual agreement. Okay, uh, it, it's, thank you. It's just the pilot. Okay, uh, item uh, 10, motion support for the ad adaption of small businesses to physical distancing requirements. Uh, Councillor um, uh, uh, Fleury and I have a motion. Um, be it resolved that the rules of, of, of uh, procedure be suspended because this is obviously timely with respect to patios on suspension. Carried. Any dissents? Carried. So I'll just read, I think people, members of uh, uh, council, I believe it's on the screen or it will be on the screen. I'll just read the therefore be it resolved. So this is moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Fleury. Uh, therefore be it resolved that council delegate to the general manager of planning, infrastructure and economic development in consultation with the director of traffic services, the authority to authorize the temporary road closure of segments of any city of Ottawa road as a temporary measure through to October 30th as part of the City of Ottawa's economic recovery efforts. Be it further resolved that this delegation of authority only be exercised where two-thirds of the business owners on each block segment approved of the road closure as provided in writing by the GM and the Director. Be it further resolved that all costs of the road closure are borne by the applicants except for any city operational costs that are already part of existing departmental budgets. 
uh, and be it further resolved that as a continuation of the successful 2019 pilot project closure of a portion of William Street, the City of Ottawa transfer as budgeted and planned up to $75,000 in funding from PIED's minor public realm capital account to Marche's Ottawa Markets Corporation upon written confirmation of both the proposed cost sharing expenditure plan and a commitment to report out on the use of these funds to the members, provide it uh, to the satisfaction of the GM of PIED to implement any necessary road closures in accordance with the draft byward market public realm plan and to ensure the resiliency of this city owned um, asset. So we have a committee recommendation, then we have this motion that is um, amending, and then we have another motion here by Councillor Tierney. I believe this is Tierney and El Shantiri. So Councillor Tierney, do you want to introduce your motion as well? Sure, um, we need Mayor, to suspend uh, the rules. Uh, Sorry, po apologize, Councillor. Suspension of the rules. Carried. Carried. Any dissents? Okay, Councillor Tierney, please. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, did you want me just to go to there for it be resolved? To, uh, help I think, yeah, I think it? that's best because everyone has the rest of the whereases. Sure. Uh, so, therefore, it be resolved that Council direct staff of Planning, Infrastructure, Economic Development to initiate the temporary zoning bylaw amendments to amend the provision to allow for physical distancing requirements that pertain to restaurants, outdoor commercial patios, and retail stores for the period of July 15th to October 31st, 2020, which shall be brought to Planning Committee on June 25th, 2020, and to uh, Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee on July 8, 2020, to uh, approve uh, that uh, the outdoor commercial patios and retail patios on private property uh, where they use, where they currently use permitted zoning, that the city waive the enforcement for any zoning provisions related to the setbacks from the residential zones, requiring or providing parking such as they may establish on a lot adjacent or nearby a lot, provided provided that the outdoor commercial patio and retails are temporary in nature with no permanent fixtures or alter, alterations that require a building permit and have the permission of the property owner until such time that the temporary zoning bylaw is in full of force and effect and three approve the attached business process uh, in document one uh, be established for those temporary outdoor commercial patios within the 30 meter of residential zone. And just of note, Mr. Mayor, if you look at document one, it does address some of the concerns around uh, amplification devices, which Councillor Furry did have a concern about. And uh, there is also a friendly amendment motion from a vice, uh, from, uh, from uh, Councillor Leeper. So on this, uh, cheers to this. Okay, Councillor Leeper um, and Councillor McKenney uh, have a, an amendment or a friendly amendment, I believe, on suspension of the rules to allow it to be introduced. Carried. Thank you. Any dissents? Councillor Leeper, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, we're just looking to bring, and I'm pleased that uh, it's been uh, accepted as friendly, um, some nuance around the opening hours currently the business process would allow them to be open until 1 a.m uh, we're asking that that be amended to read uh, up to 1 a.m uh, with hours to be determined in consultation with the ward councillor okay that's uh, pretty straightforward so that's a friendly amendment so just for members of council and public and media who are following this we have a uh, committee recommendation then an amendment by uh, myself, second by Councillor Fleury, and then Councillor Tierney and El Shantiri with a friendly amendment by Councillor Leeper and McKenney. Does anyone wish to uh, speak to any of the amendments or the, the main report? Okay, so... Uh, Councillor Moffat, I just have a quick question. Councillor Moffat. Thanks. Just on the, the Leeper amendments, is that... I'm not sure how staff are planning to treat that. Is that a, a full-on veto by the councillor, or is it a is it a notification process? Just just curious what what that impact is. Does it create the sole authority of the councillor to say yes or no to a patio opening at, to a certain time? Mr. Mayor, it will be in consultation with the councillor. It will be a consultative process. Right, so, and if the, if the councillor opposes an opening to 1 a.m., what's, 
the end result of that. Uh, Chair, if I may, as Councillor Leeper, my understanding or my intention here is that uh, this would open up uh, an opportunity to talk to staff who, who still have the delegated authority or not to uh, permit the uh, patio, but uh, it does give us the opportunity in some cases where we can foresee that, um, you know, 1 a.m. opening for a bar, for example, might not be appropriate in the parking lot that is next to a um, uh, a house. Uh, it does give us the opportunity to talk to the owner and to staff uh, about whether or not a 1 a.m. opening is uh, appropriate, but it does not, uh, as I've written it, uh, provide for a veto. That's correct. Does that Thank satisfy you, you Councillor Moffat? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so on the uh, Watson Fleury uh, amendment, carried. Any dissents? Carried. Carried. Uh, and the Councillor Tierney and El Shantiri with the friendly amendment by Councillors Leeper and McKenney. Carried. Carried. Any Carried. dissents? Carried. And on the main report as amended. Carried. 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 Thank you. Carried. All right. So now we are off to, just a moment please. Uh, disposition of items by committees under delegated authority suite à donner des articles ratifiés par les comités en vertu de pouvoir délégué. The Council received the list of items approved by its committees under delegated authority attached as document one. Carried. Um, I'm going to ask if there's a reason to go in camera for the collective agreement. I know that members of Council were invited to the Transit uh, Commission. Uh, does anyone have any questions that would involve going in camera? No. No? So, uh, Councillor uh, Hubley, would you like to offer a comment? Because this is uh, obviously uh, some very good news for both uh, the employees as well as the passengers of OC Transpo. And uh, as head yes. of transit, you'd like to offer a comment? I would, and there's also a motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, do you want me to read that at the same time? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Uh, first off, I'd like to congratulate Mr. Manconi and his team, as well as uh, Clint Crabtree and uh, his uh, negotiation team, as well, for all their hard work, uh, especially, uh, you know, even in the, the what we could used to refer to as normal times, it can be a very difficult process to uh, iron out a collective agreement uh, the fact that they did it during a pandemic uh, makes it all that much uh, more of an achievement and so I'd like to thank them uh, and their teams for their hard work on this um, it is um, a five-year contract which uh, I think speaks to itself uh, about the cooperation that was achieved here so I'll go right to the motion um, whereas uh, the city of Ottawa the city um, and the Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 279, uh, ATU uh, 279, uh, have uh, committed to working collaboratively to resolve issues of mutual concern in the workplace. And whereas the collective agreement between the city and ATU 279 expired on March 31st, 2020, and whereas the bargaining teams for the city and the ATU 279 have been in negotiations in an effort to conclude a renewal of the collective agreement on mutually agreeable terms, and whereas the city and ATU 279 bargaining team concluded a tentative agreement on May 13, 2020, subject to the ratification by ATU 279 uh, membership and city council, and whereas ATU membership has ratified the tentative agreement by a vote of its membership on June 6, 2020, and whereas the tentative agreement recognizes the valuable work and dedication of the ATU membership and also serves to ensure the continuity of transit service during the critical period of the pandemic recovery and continued important role that transit plays in ensuring the Ottawa continues to be a vibrant, sustainable city. Therefore, be it resolved that the Transit Commission uh, recommends that the City Council ratify the tentative agreement reached with the ATU Local 2709 and be it further resolved that the terms of the tentative agreement can now be made public once passed. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hubley and Councillor Cloutier. Uh, any uh, questions uh, or comments on the resolution put forward by Councillor Hubley? Okay, can I say so something? Uh Go ahead, Councillor Meehan, go ahead. 
Uh, I would like to go on record as saying uh, I believe that our transit workers uh, deserve an increase at this time, and I think this is a good contract. But my initial reaction is that given the hemorrhaging uh, in your city due to uh, our lost revenues and ridership and uh, other, uh, other revenue streams in the city, uh, I think it would have been prudent perhaps to discuss maybe a uh, wage freeze as I will be proposing for a lot of other employees in the city at this time. Uh, one year wage freeze, uh, we've all had, we've continued to maintain our jobs through the pandemic, including our OC Transpo and other staff. Um, unlike other sectors of our society, and uh, a, w a wage freeze for one year would certainly help our city finances. Um, I, I understand that we can't arbitrarily impose a wage freeze, and that's why we are supporting this, uh, this contract. Uh, but I'd just like to put that on record. I think uh, that belt tightening is warranted right across the board, especially at this time. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other comments? So on the report, on the, uh, the report from Transit Commission, carried. Carried. Carried, thank you. Um, motion to adopt reports, motion portant adoption de rapport, Councillor Dudas, seconded by Councillor Elshantiri, please. That the report from the Ottawa Community Housing Corporation entitled Ottawa Community Housing Corporation Annual Report and Annual General Meeting of the Shareholder the reports from the Finance Services Department entitled Sinking Fund Financial Statements 2019 and 2019 City of Ottawa Consolidated Financial Statements, Agricultural and Rural Affairs Committee Report 13, Finance and Economic Development Committee Report 14, Planning Committee Report 23, Transportation Com Committee Report 9, and the report from the City Clerk's Office entitled Summary of Oral and Written Public Submissions for Items Subject to the Planning Act Explanation Requirements at the City Council Meeting of May 27, 2020, be received and adopted as amended. Okay, on the motion. Carried, adopté. Okay. Any dissents? Yes. Uh, motions of which notice have been previously given. Motion dont avis a été donné entièrement. Uh, motion by myself, signed by Councillor Dudas. Um, I'll just read the therefore be it resolved. The Council support Councillor Brockington to stand for election to the AMO Board of Directors as Director Regional and Single Tier Caucus. Questions or comments? On the motion? Carried? Carried. Okay. Carried. Any dissents? Yes, I'll dissent, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Hubley. Okay. Uh, motions requiring suspension of the rules. Motion exigeant la suspension des règles de procédure. First is Councillor Eglai, second by, seconded by Councillor Harder. On suspension of the rules with respect to a, a, a property a, or a sign uh, encroachment. On suspension, carried? Carried. Okay. Any dissents? Councillor Eglai, if you'd like to uh, read the uh, therefore, be it resolves. Please. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I will do that right now, and then I want to make a brief comment. So uh, let me do the comment first. So this motion is to allow um, the, uh, the Nepean Sportsplex sign to be replaced um, because it is at the end of its life cycle, and there are some structural integrity issues with it. So it needs to be replaced. Uh, the original sign was grandfathered under our, our uh, uh, permanent signs on private property bylaw. And um, so this is just to allow the replacement to go in uh, and on the same footings, essentially. The sign will be very similar to what we have at some other um, uh, sites like the Mitchell Recreation Complex and the Rich Craft Recreation Centre. Um, uh, I just wanted to address very quickly, Mr. Mayor, a number of things came up on social media this morning. So I just wanted to quickly say, so it is being replaced because, again, it's necessary to be replaced uh, for life cycle reasons. Uh, there is no agreement, uh, as was set out uh, on social media, for um, private ads on the sign. The sign will be used for City of Ottawa and Sportsplex messaging for events, programs, um, it's, it's not going to be used to advertise private businesses. Um, it, uh, the, the sign itself, which is iconic with the Nepean Bell on it, uh, we are going to be providing um, part of the sign with the Nepean Bell to the Nepean Museum so that it can be preserved. 
And finally, um, working, I will be working with staff um, uh, and to find a way to incorporate um, the PM Bell on this sign again. Uh, so that that iconic bell of, of the PN, which we're all so proud of, um, it will remain part of that sign. I'm working with Kevin Wary, and those of you who work with him know how creative he can be. So we'll find a way to do that. So I just wanted to clarify all those things um, before before the vote, in case anybody had uh, in council had seen them. Uh, and uh, so this this will simply allow the project to go ahead. It's already fully funded. And again, it's necessary for life cycle reasons. Thank you. Great, thank you. Councillor Harder is the seconder. Do and you I, I didn't actually read it. Uh, Ms. Murray, I should read it. Therefore, be it resolved that Council approve an exemption to Section 122 for private private property bylaw uh, 2016 326 related to sign height, sign space area, and center area to allow the RCFS replacement ground side for the north entrance to the PN Sports Park at 1701 Woodruff Avenue, as shown on Figure 2. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Harder, as a seconder, would you like to speak? No. no um, you know, obviously it's, uh, it's uh, very historical uh, um, to uh, lose a piece of the uh, bell, but at least we're keeping the real one, and there's no threat of it going anywhere from the front of Ben Franklin Place. So uh, happy to see this, that the uh, sign's been in disrepair for a long time, um, and uh, I think the new one will uh, look very good. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Councillor Leeper, don't rise to the challenge of a debate on the bell, please. <laughs> the debate that keeps on giving. <laughs> That's right. Um, on the, uh, the motion, carried? Carried. Carried. All right. Any dissents? No. Okay, uh, Councillor uh, Dudas, uh, seconded by Councillor Kavanaugh, with respect to um, active transportation uh, grant applications, the timeliness of this, on suspension, carried? Carried. Any dissents? Uh, Councillor Dudas, you'd like to introduce the motion, please. Very much so. I, I'm going to read the motion, um, but I just want to say that um, now is the time to prioritize active transportation because it sends a clear message to our residents that we're focused on their safety by providing them with healthy transportation op options as we recover from the pandemic. So I am going to re read the whereas uh, be resolved. So whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has in many respects been a transformative event for the City of Ottawa, has shined a light on our existing travel patterns and led to a serious self-examination of how we want to move around as a city. And whereas over the last few weeks, Ottawa has seen a strong rise in the number of residents walking or cycling to get around, a trend that is anticipated to continue. And whereas as we begin to move into COVID-19 recovery, it's imperative that we seize this opportunity to look towards smarter, greener planning strategies that build up the necessary infrastructure to expand our cycling, pedestrian, and multimodal networks. And whereas we know that expanding our green infrastructure, and in particular active transportation networks, especially connectivity to transit, this will allow residents to move around in an easier, healthier, and a safer way. And whereas the city has been preparing the Ottawa Cycling Plan and the Ottawa Pedestrian Plan as components of the Transportation Master Plan, itself part of the updated official plan, and whereas in 2019 the population of Ottawa passed the million mark, and over the next 25 years we're expected to add another 400,000 residents, all of whom will require improved and strategic transportation infrastructure to meet this growth and our future mobility needs. And whereas, due to the financial impact of the pandemic, the City of Ottawa is losing roughly $1 million every day and is calling on our federal and provincial partners to provide emergency operational funding. However, recognizing the possibility of federal infrastructure stimulus funding separate from that operational ask, while the city, city still needs to fund green active transportation infrastructure and networks as identified in the Transportation Master Plan. And whereas the mayor and several city councillors, including the council representatives on the Association of Municipalities of Ottawa, Ontario, and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, co-signed a letter recognizing that with the support of our provincial and federal partners, along with unified support from council, we can prioritize the expansion of our active transportation infrastructure, improving integration into our expanding transit system, making a long-term investment in Ottawa residents' health and, and well-being, all while addressing our city's current and future mobility needs, 
Therefore, it be resolved that the city send a letter to the Federal Minister of Infrastructure and Communities, the Honourable Catherine McKenna, as well as the Minister of Finance, the Honourable Bill Morneau, calling for any pandemic recovery infrastructure stimulus funding to prioritize and accelerate active transportation and transit infrastructure projects, and be it further resolved, the Council directs city staff to identify, with the input of members of Council, the prioritized shovel-ready or high-priority projects where expedited design and construction timelines are feasible. Projects to be identified include cycling, pedestrian, multi-use networks, and transit infrastructure in communities across the city, especially those with connectivity to transit, so that such projects might be fast-tracked and delivered should our federal partners develop infrastructure stimulus programs. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Cavanaugh is the seconder of the motion. Would you like to speak to it? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't think I have much to add, and I want to thank uh, Councillor Dudas for putting this forward. Um, we definitely have gaps in our um, active transportation network, and uh, this is an opportunity if we're looking for shovel-ready projects and beyond. We, we need to um, uh, fight right now um, and see what we can get because um, this is about uh, job creation. This is about uh, a, a better network throughout our city. Thank you. Anyone else wish to uh, speak to the Dudas Kavanaugh motion? Yes, I would, Mr. Mayor. Council Hubley. Same with myself. Council Hubley, go ahead. Yes, okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just want to get clarification over one of the uh, paragraphs there that Councillor Duda has just mentioned. Uh, I had concerns at the start of this, Mr. Mayor, uh, the impact on the letter that you sent on behalf of all of Council looking for the federal government to step in and help us with the shortfalls uh, that are due to the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Did I hear correctly in there that we have assurance that uh, any ask through a stimulus fund will not uh, reduce the amount that we would get under uh, that support uh, that comes from your letter? Uh, the short answer to that is yes. Uh, these are, uh, in essence, capital funds. What we're looking for are both capital and operating out of a different budget line from the federal government. There's a separate program okay. for this. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Tierney, I think I heard you uh, wanting to speak. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just want to confirm with staff uh, that this is the revised version of the motion. Ms. Chia, is, that, is this the revised version? I think that uh, Councillor Dudas worked, I believe, with my office and members of council to bring forward. Here, Councillor Dudas, can you answer that? Um, yes, I believe this is the one that was provided by Caitlin as the last version. Let me just check the... Yeah, unfortunately, it's not on the screen, so I just want to be sure of that because yep. uh, the previous motion, as much work was put into it, it would have mm -hmm. screened out, uh, unfortunately, some of our, our transit-related uh, pedestrian cycling links like Blair Road. And my understanding is with this modification, it now includes that or would allow that opportunity to be there, uh, as well as many other places within the city. So I just want to confirm that this is the, the new version yeah, and the deputy clerk yes, has just confirmed it as well. So, the, sorry, it, the, the, it has the word transit sorry. infrastructure. In. Yeah, and the deputy clerk Wonderful. has confirmed that as well, okay. Councillor Tierney. So, this is the latest new version that does include the the transit links. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. So, Mayor. Yes. Mr. Mr. Mayor, it's Councillor Harder. Councillor Harder, um, go I ahead. I just have a question. I was listening. I was listening to um, the motion being read, and. Um, did I hear that any money coming from um, uh, the government, the federal government, would get, would be uh, going to to this initiative? Is that what I heard the motion say? Uh, no, no Councillor, that's after, not. After the McKenna um, Mor uh, uh, Morno. No, so I, I can speak to that, Mr. Mayor, and I'm happy to answer that. Go ahead. No, this to. So in the further be it resolved, it speaks to the fact that we're asking for them to uh, help us prioritize this stimulus funding um, if they were to choose to implement a, an infrastructure stimulus program. Um, but this doesn't preclude us from or prohibit us 
from accessing, accessing any other funding opportunities. And I'd, I'd like to say, too, that if the federal government wishes to be so kind and so generous as to expand the envelope and the scope of what they do end up providing a stimulus, that doesn't, this doesn't stop us from accessing that money as well. This is more so to, to put out a clear message to uh, our residents and our federal partners that if money's on the table for active transportation, we've got projects ready and we're good to go. Okay, thank you for that clarification. <clears throat> I will. I don't know why my voice is um, is uh, echoing like that. I have taken myself off the speaker as well, Mr. Mayor. So, I just wanted to um, be on the record as saying that my concern initially was um, with the projects that would be available that were red, shovel ready, and I did ask uh, along with Councillor Hubley, uh, Ms. G, last week, um, and uh, it was only yesterday that um, she came back. There is a very small list uh, relative to uh, the size of our city and the number of our wards. So I don't know if everybody has seen that. I intend to support this today, but I do need to go on record and say that none of those projects are in my ward. And if they were, they would have to be done with the building of a road. Because without the road and only having ditches, I'm not going to have any way to have any active transportation uh, until those new things happen. And I definitely wouldn't want to uh, further uh, um, delay um, all modes of, uh, of transportation, certainly, including, of course, transit, which is paramount. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Harder. Uh, other comments or questions on the motion? So on uh, the uh, motion um, carried? Adopted? Carried. Any dissents? Dissents. Dissent, Councillor... Shirelli, defense. Councillor Shirelli. Uh, okay, next we have... Um, this was a tradition uh, always uh, done by our colleague, Councillor Deans, the um, Seniors Month uh, motion, and obviously, Councillor Deans, I'm sure she is watching us as we speak, and we wish her continued speedy recovery with her health challenges, and stepping in to help is Councillor Kavanaugh, seconded by Councillor Hubley. Uh, for seniors month. So on suspension of the rules, carried. Adopt okay. a. Uh, Councillor Kavanaugh, please. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you to Councillor Dean, who I know is listening, uh, for reminding us about this very important uh, uh, declaration. Um, so I'll read it out. Whereas Canadian demographics indicate that seniors are one of the fastest growing population groups in our community, and for the first time, the share of seniors at 16.9% of the population exceeds the share of children at 16.6% of the population in Canada. Whereas according to the 2016 census for Statistics Canada, 144,140 seniors ages 65 and older over reside in the city of Ottawa, making up 15.4% of the total population. And it's expected that by the year 2031, more than one in five residents living in Ottawa will be over 65. Whereas the City of Ottawa has benefited from many tireless hours of volunteer work and leadership generously, generously donated by local senior citizens, whereas senior citizens have helped to build our communities through active living, shared knowledge and diversity of experiences, whereas the month of June is recognized by the province of Ontario as Seniors Month. Therefore, be it resolved that the Ottawa City Council declare June 2020 to be Seniors Month in the City of Ottawa. Thank you. Great, thank you. Councillor uh, uh, Hubley is the seconder. Would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councillor Kavanaugh spoke very well for it, and, and like you, uh, I'm recalling many a times Councillor Deans uh, moved this motion, so I'm happy to support it. Great. Uh, anyone else wish to speak to it? So on the motion by Councillor Kavanaugh, seconded by Councillor Hubley. Carried? Carried. Carried. Any dissents? Carried. Sorry, was that a dissent? No? Okay. I hope it wasn't <laughs> for Seniors Month. Uh, anyone else have a motion requiring suspension of the rules of procedure? No. Notice a motion for consideration at subsequent meeting. Avis de motion pour examen réunion subsequente. 
Notice of intent. Notice of intent from Hydro Ottawa Holding Inc. to hold the annual general meeting of the shareholder at City Council meeting scheduled for June 24th, 2020. A motion to introduce bylaws, Monsieur Pontant, Présentation de Règlement, and note that bylaw D is not proceeding at this time. Councillor Dudas, please. That the bylaws listed on the agenda under motion to introduce bylaws, three readings be re read and passed, with the exception of the following bylaw listed as D on the agenda, which has been withdrawn for inclusion on a future council agenda. A D has read a bylaw of the City of Ottawa to establish certain lands as common and public highway and assume them for public use, promenade, city gate drive, place, cross keys place, through system house street. Sorry. Whoops. Okay. Sorry, did the following bylaw be written past? Okay, so on the uh, motion by Councillor Dudas, seconded by Councillor El Shantiri, carried. Carried. Uh, Confirmate. Con any dissents? Confirmation bylaw, règlement de rectification, Councillor Dudas and El Shantiri, please. Did the following bylaw be read and passed to confirm the proceedings of the Council meeting of June 10th, 2020? Carried. Adopté. Carried. 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 Any dissents? We have uh, three written inquiries. The first, Councillor Fleury, please. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Cannabis retail concentration inquiry. The City of Ottawa wants to continue to support business improvement areas. Currently, there are six retail cannabis stores in Ottawa, in Ward 12, specifically in the Byward Market. There is one located at 129 York Street and another one located at 121 Clarence Street. There are three new applications in the Byward Market, one at 171 Rideau, 87 Clarence Street, uh, and 155 Parent. These applications raise concerns of concentration of one type of retailer within a commercial area uh, as being created. We are concerned about the concentration of cannabis shops in one specific area of our city. We were in favor of the LCBO-like model proposed by the previous provincial government and had reaffirmed need to offer city oversight as it related to separation distances for these applications. Currently, if the AGCO approves these licenses, the Byward Market would have five retail cannabis stores within 250 meters. The Community Association, the City, and the BIAs have continued to pursue a healthy mix of businesses in the Byron Market area. One, what is the city, City's responsibility to make sure a concentration of cannabis licenses in one commercial area is not created? Two, what is the level of City engagement and consultation with the AGCO as it relates to cannabis licenses? Three, can the City describe, describe its current efforts to encourage a healthy mix in the city and specifically in the Byron market? And four, can the city please inform us what is the best approach to prevent and resolve concentration risk of cannabis licenses in one given area? Great, thank you. Next inquiry is by Councillor Brockington. Councillor Brockington. Uh, I believe that's from Councillor McKinney. Oh, I have your name down on here, sorry. Okay, Councillor McKinney. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I put this forward with uh, Councillor Brockington. Uh, this inquiry is in response to the direction uh, to the city manager from Mayor Watson and Chair, Chair Suds on June 9, 2020, uh, for a full review of the matter involving bylaw services following a police investigation into the action of one of its officers. Um, could legal services provide council with any mechanisms available through the Municipal Act or other legislation to bring an independent review of the findings arising from the review to be conducted by bylaw services? Thank you. Uh, and the final one is Councillor King. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this inquiry is on uh, behalf of myself and uh, Councillor Menard on the uh, subject of public process for policing reform. We are requesting that staff review and present at least three different options without a recommendation for a public engagement process on the subject of reforms to the Ottawa Police Service, which could include input from members of the public, community organizations, community and social services, public health, crime prevention Ottawa, city council members, including the liaison for anti-racism and ethno-cultural relations, and the police board, among others. The inquiry would include informal discussions with the members inquiring and a response back to City Council by the end of June 2020. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dudas, uh, adjournment please. 
Second by Council Ocean Theory. That the proceedings of City Council meeting of June 10th, 2020 be adjourned. On the motion, carried. Adopté. Carried. Carried. Mm -hmm. Any dissents? So the media availability will take place uh, in uh, 15.